Coming in at number 5 we have Padre Hotel. The Padre Hotel located in Bakersfield has a reputation for being a terrifying place to stay. Many admit they were skeptical at first but the hotel lived up to the paranormal stories. The hotel was first opened in 1928. Since then it's seen many tragedies take place within its walls. The local archives hold many stories of those who have lost their lives there. These guests now haunt the hotel, leaving behind signs that they still stay here to this day. There have been so many incidents here, it's sometimes unclear who was contacting the guests. In the 1950s there was a large fire where many perished. Some say that in spots around the hotel you feel an intense panic and sense of terror come over you, as if you yourself were trapped in the blaze. The upper floors are said to have the most paranormal activity, in particular the 7th floor. It is said to be a hotbed for unexplained paranormal happenings. Many guests even request to stay on this floor to see if they can experience these terrors for themselves. The hotel's general manager has shared some of the terrifying experiences she has had there. She said one night while she was making her rounds, she opened a door to a closet. Suddenly, she had an overwhelming feeling of cold and immediate adrenaline. She said her hair was standing up on her arm. Suddenly, the door slammed and she ran as fast as she could out of the hotel. She said she told a couple of people who found her outside. She was clearly frightened and everyone wanted to know what she saw. She said since then she has rarely told the story. She has worked there for over 10 years and has never felt fear like this before. Others have witnessed reoccurring ghosts, stories that fit together from strangers who have never met. One common sight at the hotel is a man stood on the roof. Many see him as they first arrive at the hotel thinking he might be doing work on the roof. They think nothing of it. He has been seen many times by different guests. Those who ask what he is doing up there are told no one is allowed on the roof after a tragic accident had occurred at the hotel years ago. Many believe it is the man's ghost who keeps appearing to guests as a warning to not enter the hotel. In at number 4 we have Alcatraz Island. Alcatraz Island is one of the most notorious prisons in history and can be found on the San Francisco Bay. Before it became a federal penitentiary, it was discovered by Spanish naval officer and explorer Juan Manuel de Ayala who founded the island in 1775 and built several small buildings and other minor structures on the island. In 1850, President Millard Fillmore ordered Alcatraz Island to be set aside specifically as a United States military reservation for military purposes following the Mexican-American War. In 1861, the island held hundreds of Civil War prisoners. Then in 1934, the prison opened and operated until March 1963 and as of lately has become a major tourist attraction. Alcatraz is the site of a now abandoned federal prison, the oldest operating lighthouse on the west coast of the United States and early military fortifications. Landmarks on the island include the main cell house dining hall, lighthouse, the ruins of the warden's house, social hall, parade ground, recreation yard, water tower and other small buildings. Some of the most infamous criminals were kept at Alcatraz over the years and due to the strong currents around the island and the ice cold water temperatures, it made escaping nearly impossible. Some of the most notorious criminals held at Alcatraz include Al Capone, George Machine Gun Kelly and Bumpy Johnson. Contrary to popular belief, it was in fact possible to escape and swim to shore. Extremely hard, but possible. During the 29 years of operation, the penitentiary claimed that no prisoner successfully escaped, but many questioned that. A total of 36 prisoners made 14 different escape attempts. 23 were caught alive, 6 were shot and killed during their escape two drowned and five are listed as missing and presumed drowned but that is highly debated. Many believe that the five missing all or at least some of them were able to make it to land and were never caught. Due to the amount of history and deaths in and around the island, many believe there are dozens of spirits that roam in the abandoned buildings and even in death are unable to escape the island. Alcatraz is a popular tourist attraction because of its ghost sightings, weird occurrences and history and they offer daily tours to see the island and its buildings. In at number 3 we have the Queen Mary. The iconic Queen Mary ship is located in Long Beach and is one of the most haunted destinations in the United States. The ship was first christened in 1934 by Queen Mary herself and it was retired more than three decades later. It has since been converted into a hotel where guests can sleep surrounded by the original wood panelling and portholes. If you do plan on staying on the ship, you may not be the only guest here though. There are multiple stories of different spirits that haunt the ship. There are so many different rooms on the ship that are haunted by many different ghosts, including the Mauritania Room, the Mayfair Room, 
room, boiler room number four, and the first class swimming pool, just to name a few. Stateroom B340 in particular was a problem long before the Queen Mary became a hotel. In 1948, British third class passenger Walker J. Adamson passed away in the room, and the details of his death are unknown. Later in 1966, a woman staying in the room reported that she had awoken when the bed covers were pulled off her and she saw a man standing at the foot of her bed. She screamed and rang for the steward, but the man quickly vanished into thin air. Years later, guests staying in the room reported hearing someone knocking on the door in the middle of the night, seeing bathroom lights mysteriously turn on, and even the hotel's maids would often find the bathroom water running, even when no one had stayed in the room for days. Another area that is a paranormal hotspot is Shaft Alley or Hatch Door Number 13, and it was the site of a gruesome accident where a crewman was crushed to death. His ghost is regularly seen around the area now. People often report hearing the sound of someone running behind them and whistling, while others have noticed that spots of grease that appear to look like fingerprints appear on their face. And some have even seen a figure of a bearded man in blue overalls that looks like a crewman. Due to the amount of paranormal activity, many ghost enthusiasts, investigators, and TV shows frequently visit the ship to stay and partake in the ghost tours they offer. In at number two, we have the Roosevelt Hotel. The Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood was made famous due to the number of celebrities, past and present, who have stayed there, including one of the most famous women in history, Marilyn Monroe, who stayed at the hotel for two years early in her career and posed for her first commercial photography shoot by the hotel's pool. Many believe her spirit, among others, still linger through the halls of the hotel. Some of the most famous people in history have stayed at this notorious hotel, including Charlie Chaplin, Shirley Temple, Prince, Ernest Hemingway, Brad Pitt, and Angelina Jolie, just to name a few. The hotel opened in 1927 and is the oldest continually operating hotel in Los Angeles and is named after the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. It is a staple in Hollywood due to it being on Hollywood Boulevard and being so close to the Hollywood Walk of Fame and the famous Chinese Theatre. The first ever Academy Award ceremony was held at the hotel on May 16, 1929, inside the Blossom Ballroom. It was a private ceremony open only to the Academy members, with a total of 270 people in attendance. At the time, the Oscar Nick name for the award had not yet been invented. It would be introduced four years later. Many guests have experienced paranormal activities while visiting the hotel, like feeling cold spots, receiving mysterious phone calls, and capturing orbs in their photographs. There are many rumours of hauntings and ghosts at the hotel involving celebrities who have previously stayed there, like Montgomery Cliff, Carol Lombard, and Errol Flynn. Other stories involve a little girl in a blue dress named Caroline that have been seen by multiple hotel guests and employees. Montgomery Cliff's spirit has been blamed for patting guests' shoulders and watching the maids who clean his old room, 928, where he stayed for a total of three months while filming From Here to Eternity. Carol Lombard has also been spotted floating around the upper floors. The most famous spirit of the hotel is, of course, Marilyn Monroe. Many people believe she still roams the hotel and can be found in her old room, 1200, and many have witnessed her ghostly figure in the mirror. This hotel is both famous and notorious, and if you're brave enough, you can stay in these celebrities' old rooms. And finally, in at number one, we have the Cecil Hotel. The Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles has been known by many to be haunted hotel, but gained massive media and global attention when the popular Netflix documentary came out regarding the disappearance of Elisa Lam, who went missing while staying at the hotel. The case was extremely mysterious and made many question the sinister background of this notorious hotel. The hotel was built in 1924 as a destination for business travelers and tourists. It flourished throughout the 1940s, but saw a decline as the nearby Skid Row became extremely overpopulated and drugs and crime ran rapid. As many as 10,000 homeless people lived within a four mile radius from the hotel. For decades, this hotel had a reputation for violence and death due to the number of mysterious cases that have happened throughout the years at the Cecil. The first documented case of someone taking their own life occurred in 1927 when Percy Cook shot himself while inside his hotel room after failing to reconcile with his wife and child. The next one occurred in 1931 and more happened throughout the 1940s and 50s. Not only have many people taken their own life in this hotel, but many unresolved murders and mysterious deaths have also happened here. Many people believe all these occurrences make this one of the most haunted places in California due to all the souls still roaming around the hotel. One of the most famous true crime cases is that of the Black Dahlia, and it was confirmed in 2015 that Elizabeth Short was seen drinking at the Cecil's bar in the days before her notorious and unsolved murder in 1947. In the 1980s, the hotel had been the residence of one of the most famous serial killers of all time, Richard Ramirez.
Perez, nicknamed the Night Stalker. Throughout the 1980s, he ran rapid in his killing spree, and he was a regular presence on the Skid Row area. And according to a hotel clerk who claims to have spoken to Richard, he had stayed at the hotel for weeks before his capture in 1985. Another serial killer, Austrian man Jack Underwaker, stayed at the Cecil in 1991, possibly sought to copy Ramirez's crimes. While staying there, he had killed at least three women. An astonishing number of people have lost their lives at this notorious hotel, and many deaths remain unsolved to this day. When Elisa Lam's case was made public, it caused even more confusion and questions about what really goes on at this hotel. The Cecil Hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places, not only in California, but throughout the world. Number five on this list is the Molly Brown House. If you live in Denver, then there is no way that you aren't familiar with this haunted place. Thrillist says, you've no doubt heard of the Molly Brown House and likely passed it on the street once or twice too. Molly Brown was a notable member of Denver's elite and perhaps known best for being a titanic survivor and despite allegedly living a relatively happy life, visitors to the museum and staff have reported quite a bit of strange happenings. Some have smelled what's believed to be husband JJ Brown's pipe or have witnessed lights off and on the fritz and staff have reported furniture being seemingly rearranged. Sometimes figures can even be seen roaming the house. A visit is worth it alone for the history, but the potential for getting a bit spooked or walking into a cold spot is definitely an added bonus. We once again have one of those locations where no one has any idea why it's haunted. It just is. Maybe it's the connection to the Titanic that has got this place acting funky. Obviously, that was a very unnatural occurrence and took the lives of tons of people in a very sad way. So I could believe that the Titanic and the survivor of the Titanic plays some role into why this place is haunted the way that it is. Good news is that this isn't the worst haunting that you can run into. Like yes, you will get a little scared for sure. You might smell something funny or have a ghost pull something on you or even maybe have small valuables go missing. But ultimately, you probably shouldn't be dragged to the underworld here by some shadow demon or anything like that. So I guess if you were to visit any place on this list, then this one wouldn't be the worst. Just be prepared for what's coming, because if you aren't, then it could leave you with some serious mental trauma. Number four on this list is Phantom Canyon Road. You need to be very careful on this road because there is a good chance you could suffer a serious crash if you aren't. Thrillist says a haunted road is one thing, but a haunted road in Colorado means you're likely on the edge of a mountain and at some serious elevation. Phantom Canyon Road is a detour off the Gold Belt Tour byway connecting Cripple Creek and Florence and was originally the railroad for that route. As you drive along, you can clear clearly see the ghost towns of Wilbur, Adelaide, and Glenbrook, and legend has it that the reason for Phantom Canyon's name is credited to sightings of a man wearing a prison uniform walking along the tracks in the 1890s. The man supposedly had been executed at the Colorado State Penitentiary a few days earlier. So yeah guys, you better have your wits about you, cause if you don't, this ghost might come out and startle the crap out of you, and then the next thing you know, you're gonna be face deep into a tree somewhere. It also just adds to the horror ambiance that you're driving past several ghost towns along the way. Like of course they just had to be on the side of the road as you're also getting stalked by this ghost prisoner. No one really knows what this prisoner wants with you, but let's face it, I can't imagine it's good. My dude was executed back in the day, so for one, what he did was probably pretty bad to warrant a punishment like that, and then secondly, he literally got executed and I can only guess that his his ghost probably isn't too pleased about that. Y'all need to be especially careful if you're driving down this road, cause at any point this guy could pop out. Number three on this list is Central City Masonic Cemetery. Of course we had to have a cemetery on this list. No haunted place list would be complete without at least one of them. Thrillist says, founded as a mining town in the late 1800s, Central City is now known as a destination for those looking to head to the hills for a game gambling fix in the casinos that now dot the area. But one thing hasn't changed. The woman in black who twice a year appears in this hilltop cemetery above the town. Known as the Columbine Lady, she comes to visit the grave of 
John Cameron, a prominent former resident of Central City who died in 1884. Some believe she is his fiance, appearing to leave flowers for her lost love on November 1st, the anniversary of Cameron's death, and April 5th, a date for which the significance remains a mystery, much like the woman herself. This place is safe to go to if of course you do not go during these times. She's been coming for a long time and anyone who tried to interfere with her has had to pay the price. Now people kind of suspect that she was in a relationship with John Cameron, but there's also another theory. Many people think that John actually wronged her in his life, and that this woman in black comes twice a year to double check that John is still dead and hasn't come back to life by some means. Pretty scary tale for sure, one that you probably don't want to get involved with. Number two on this list is the Broadmoor. Located in Colorado Springs, this hotel would be freaking awesome if it wasn't so haunted. Thrillist says this sprawling five star hotel has a lot to offer for anyone seeking a relaxing and indulgent getaway. But along with the golf course, spa, and nearby zoo, there's one feature you won't find in any brochure. Staff and guests alike have reported the presence of a woman, often in the penthouse where Julia Penrose, co-founder of the property, once lived. While not confirmed, Penrose's death is said to have been surrounded by a strange occurrence in which she went missing and was later found confused and shaking in the woods nearby with no memory of how she got there. She passed away a week later and perhaps her spirit remains watching over the property and seeking answers about her own mysterious death. Now I am wondering man, how did Penrose die? Like this whole story feels like a movie or something like that. I truly think somebody needs to get in here and investigate what the heck happened here. Cause like, should we be scared of the region because this is gonna happen again? Was Julia doing something specific before she disappeared and should we avoid doing that thing? There are just so many questions that need to be answered here and sadly I can't do it from the comfort of Toronto. That being said, I'm also not trying to end up like Julia and therefore we'll be leaving this job to somebody far more Qualified. And finally, number one on this list is the Highlands Ranch Mansion. A truly picturesque mansion, one that's been standing for over 100 years and one that's home to a ghostly spirit. Thrillist says this sprawling stone mansion built in 1891 is often rented for weddings and events due to its impressive structural beauty and picturesque prairie views. But it's also a historic property and somewhat of a museum of the times with a bit of paranormal activity sprinkled in. The ghost of Julia Kistler, daughter of F. Kistler, who bought the property in 1926, is said to haunt the home with visitors and staff alike reporting hearing a woman's sobs, seeing a silhouette figure moving about when the mansion was otherwise vacant, and lights sporadically turning on and off. I don't know about you guys, but during my wedding ceremony, I want to hear beautiful sounding music, not the sobs of some ghost woman thing. Apparently she's crying all the time and this woman's emotions are not something to play with. There's a story where once several children were playing around here. There was a wedding ceremony scheduled here for later that day and the children were off doing what kids do before the proceedings got underway. They ran into this ghost crying and then they started to make fun of her. They were rude and definitely unkind but they also didn't deserve what she did next. It's said that in a fit of rage she flew inside their bodies and possessed possessed each and every one of them for a short time showing them things that were truly terrifying. Things that have ultimately changed those boys' lives and altered their mentality forever. Any ghost that's capable of doing something like that, that's one that I don't want to be around. Number five on this list is Villa Paula. This haunted place is located in Miami and has quite the interesting guests in the backyard. Thrillist says, this stately white mansion was originally constructed as the Cuban consulate in the mid 1920s home to Consul Domingo Millard and his wife, Paula. The Cuban-born Paula was known to spend her days playing piano and drinking Cuban coffee until she died from complications from a leg amputation in 1932. Legend has it that Domingo interred his late wife in a sarcophagus laid in the backyard. The sarcophagus is still there, now covered by ficus tree roots and nearly impossible to reach. Whether or not it actually contains her mortal remains is debatable 
unreasonable at best, but reports of her ghost persist. It's said her ghost is in different rooms there, says History Miami's Dr. Paul George. People who've lived at Villa Paula since have had existential kinds of experiences. Among them, phantom coffee smells and piano playing, a one-legged woman roaming about as well. So there is a literal sarcophagus just chilling in this person's backyard. Can you imagine having that just show up on the house listing? I'd be like, um, no, we are not okay with that. I'm kind of surprised that no one has gone to go deal with the sarcophagus before. I mean, you can't just leave this thing down there like that and expect the ghost to just go away. I would imagine that Paula's spirit is probably tied to the sarcophagus and in turn it's tied to the area. Granted, I do kind of understand why no one wants to dig it up. Think about all the crazy stuff that's happened with the pyramids. You dig up this sarcophagus and you might end up being cursed for life. Which is obviously something that nobody wants. But now we're left in this awkward place where we can't get rid of the ghost but at the same time can't live here either. That's why I'm recommending to all of you watching, just avoid Villa Paula altogether. Number four on this list is the Blue Anchor Pub. So this is an interesting one because this pub didn't actually start in Florida. Thrillist says this pub was built in 1840s London during Jack the Ripper time, so it should be no surprise that it's haunted. The story goes that the bar was raised in London, but it's wooden interiors were sent to New York City and then onto this sleepy So Florida town in 1996. Little did anyone know that the pub's original elements came with the ghost of Bertha Starkley, a cheating wife who was murdered by her husband. Today she can be heard rattling pots, knocking things over, and wailing in the middle of the night at the Blue Anchor. Every night around 10pm, the time that she was murdered, Bertha likes to remind everyone she's still here so the current owners ring the ship's bell to scare her away. So first thing, I've never actually heard of that before where they take a building from one continent and then just decide to move it over to another continent. This bar must look pretty cool on the inside to go to all that trouble though. Obviously this was a bit of a mistake and everyone would have been better served if we relocated this thing straight to the dump. Bertha doesn't care if it's in London or America or anywhere. As long as the structure of this pub is still intact, her ghost will still be floating around, which makes it very hard to enjoy a night out at this place. Like imagine drowning several pints, going to take a piss, and then getting ambushed by some 1800s ghost in the bathroom with your pee pee hanging out. Like, I don't know if I'd ever be able to recover from that, folks. Number three on this list is St. Augustine's Lighthouse. Ah, yes, the haunted lighthouse. A true classic. Thrillist says St. Augustine's iconic lighthouse is a Florida landmark built in 1874. But climb up its 219 steps, and it's not just the views that will take your breath away. First, there's the ghost of Joseph Andrew, the original lighthouse keeper who fell to his death while painting the 165 foot tower. Then there are the Pity's two daughters who were playing with a building cart when it broke loose and slid into the nearby bay, drowning them both. While the girls giggle and run up and down the lighthouse steps, Joseph has been reported smoking cigars at the top of the lighthouse, keeping watch over his forever home. You know guys, if I had to be a ghost, then being Joseph wouldn't be the worst. I get to look out at the pretty scenery at the top of my lighthouse where hardly anyone bothers me and I get to smoke cigars all day. Like obviously I wouldn't want to be a ghost, but if I had to be then this wouldn't be that bad. Either way, I'm not a ghost now, I am very much a human being and if I want to stay a human being then I recommend avoiding this place. It can obviously be very jarring to see two little ghost girls running around and even 
even though all of these ghosts are supposed to be pretty chill, we know that the paranormal can be unpredictable. I'm sure that there are tons of other non-haunted Florida lighthouses around if you're really pining for a good view. Number two on this list is Fort East Martello. If you don't like dolls, then you really won't like this one, guys. Thrillist says, if there is one rule all Floridians follow, it's do not mess with Robert the doll. The four foot figurine has terrorized anyone who hasn't taken him seriously since he was gifted to artist Robert Jean Otto in 1904. Otto blamed any mischievous act around him on Robert the doll, effectively coining the oft-repeated Robert did it mantra. The doll currently holds court inside Fort East Martello, where he lives inside a glass case surrounded by a constant soundtrack of haunting xylophone music. The room evokes a heavy air immediately upon entering and the walls are papered with apology notes from cocky tourists who have dared cross the world's most haunted plaything. Even the Prince of Darkness himself Ozzy Osbourne felt Robert's wrath when he suffered a series of health mishaps shortly after dissing the doll on his reality show. I don't like dolls folks, especially the haunted variety, so this entry obviously had to make the list. Clearly it curses you after you see it because people literally have to come back here and ask for its forgiveness. I don't know if the notes work or not, but I guess that's all you can do when you're dealing with a haunted doll. Hopefully this doll can just chill out and stop haunting people, but in the meantime, I just flat out avoid going to this place in Florida altogether. And number one on this list is Casa Monica Resort and Spa. It really sucks that this place is so haunted because it's truly beautiful. Thrillist says St. Augustine's fanciest hotel is also its most haunted. In fact, this five-star Mediterranean revival haunt is a hotbed of spectral activity. Children are heard running along along the fourth floor, but no one is there. The radio in the Ponche de Leon suite randomly comes on, but no one's there. Guests of room 411 wake up to people staring at them, but no one's there. But it's the three-story Flagler suite high in the tower that's most haunted. Maids have seen a child's handprint appear on the first floor bathroom mirror, and after knocking, one heard a man say, we've been expecting you from an empty bedroom. Its spookiest claim to fame, however, is the male ghost staring out of the top tower window. He's believed to be the ghost of one of two people, either Franklin Smith, the architect who built the hotel, or Henry Flagler, the man who purchased it. I personally don't care if it's the architect, the man who purchased it, or God. Anyone who says I've been waiting for you as I enter an empty bedroom, it's not the type of individual I want to be around. Also, where are these children coming from and what are those sounds? Okay, so you want to tell me a scary story where the architect of the building fell in love with his work and then when he died, his ghost stayed here. All right, fine, I can buy that, I can believe that. But like, what are the children doing here? What do they have to do with this place and the architect? Maybe this is just one of those spots where it doesn't matter what happened here, it doesn't matter what will happen here in the future, it's just always destined to be haunted. In at number five, we have Whispers Estate. The Whispers Estate was built around 1894, and between 1899 and 1901 is when Dr. George and Sarah White moved in. George was a successful physician and ran his practice from their home. The two adopted many orphan children and unfortunately several passed away in the house over the years. Some of the children they took in were troubled. Many of them passed away in the bedrooms and other areas of the home and even some of Dr. White's patients have been said to have also passed while in the home. Dr. White practiced in the home for over 25 years so it's probable but unknown how many over the years had passed in the home. In the early 2000s the home underwent renovations and a lot of bizarre activity began. Many claimed that lights would flicker on and off, footsteps would be heard stomping around on the second floor, and as time went on, the activity escalated. To this day, people reserve time to come and experience all this
this paranormal activity and are encouraged to write down any experiences they had while in the home. And these accounts are posted to the Whispers Estates official Facebook page. You can go through the page and find creepy photos people have taken that show demonic figures, ghost like creatures, and even orbs. It's also pretty common for the guests to be scratched up by unseen fingernails or touched by an unseen hand. The estate earned the Whispers moniker after the numerous guests that experienced somebody whispering in their ear, somebody they couldn't see. Due to the amount of people who have passed at the home in its early days, it's like there are a number of different spirits that haunt the estate to this day. The Whispers estate is known as the fourth most haunted house in the United States, but many who have visited believe it to be the most haunted house in the entire country. In at number four, we have Rhodes Hotel. The Rhodes Hotel was established in 1893 and was named after the first owners, Clara and Newton Rhodes. The youngest child in the Rhodes family, Everett, passed in one of the second story bedrooms after contracting tuberculosis at 18 years old. Soon after their daughter's death, Newton unfortunately died, and it's believed he had died inside of the house. After Newton's passing, Clara turned the house into a dual brothel and speakeasy. It's said that one of the ladies of the night, Sarah, still haunts her bedroom tucked behind the stairs on the second floor. After Clara's death, the family home was opened as a hotel in the late 1800s and was meant to house those flocking to East Central Indiana during the natural gas boom. It's even believed that John Dillinger and Al Capone stopped at the hotel for a stay after hitching a ride on a train to Indiana. Not only did the family pass in their home, but a preacher by the name of Lester Poor supposedly hanged himself in the attic during the time when the home was converted to a hotel. But many believe his death could have been a murder. Due to the hotel's rich history, many Many locals and visitors have experienced paranormal activity, and everyone in the town knew that many spirits that passed in the building still haunt it to this day. The hotel closed its doors in 1937, and the property remained in the Rhodes family hands, but sat empty for more than 30 years. The hotel and its contents were eventually auctioned off, and it landed on the National Register of Historic Places. And the hotel saw three owners before the Haley's took it over for restoration. The Rhodes Hotel was purchased by Clint and Linda Haley in 1995, and they heard rumors about the haunting of the hotel, but this didn't faze them. They were more worried about the work they would have to do to restore the home. The Haley's claim that they didn't encounter any paranormal activity, but many find that hard to believe. The hotel was up for sale again in 2017 when a man by the name of Couch took it over for his charity. Couch had launched the Lost Limbs Foundation four years earlier, which raised funds for prosthetic limbs for children. To this day, Couch's charity has owned and run the hotel, not only had it been named among Indiana's most haunted places. But the hotel is consistently booked for private and paranormal investigations. The overnight investigation tickets can get up to $200, and this hotel attracts people from across the country. There have been many investigators that believe there is extensive activity in this old hotel, and people have captured a figure like shadow moving across the living room curtains with the use of night vision cameras. Most commonly, people hear whispers in the second floor creaking when no one is inside. Unlike the Haley's, Couch said he's seen and heard supernatural happenings in the hotel since moving onto the property in 2017. He's heard footsteps on the staircase. The property camera has turned off randomly and picked up voices before the footage flickers back on. Once while hosting an investigation, Couch said he witnessed one of many Victorian dolls left behind from a previous owner jump off of its chair. In at number three, we have Avon Bridge. The Avon Bridge is known to be haunted by almost every local living in the area. It is a massive trip art railroad trestle spinning a rural road over White Lick Creek. The bridge is a fascinating landmark in Hendricks County with lots of legends and history surrounding it, some more sinister than others. There are a few historical facts about the bridge that we do know. It was built in 1906 off County Road 625, it was designed by W. M. Dunn, and is still used today. Many haunted stories surround this bridge and the area surrounding it. One story claims that a mother had been walking on the tracks and fell to her death. The mother's wailing could be heard when you drive under the bridge. It's common for many locals to honk when driving under the bridge in an effort to muffle her screams. Another story is that a drunk rail worker slipped during construction and was buried alive in the wet cement. The tale is that when a train goes over the bridge, people claim to still hear his moaning. Many locals say that if you go near the bridge at night, you will hear moaning and can see a ghostly figure of a ghost or even two or three at a time. If you're traveling near the bridge on a hot summer day, you may be witness to the ghost tears streaming down the concrete. Many people don't even refer to it as the Avon Bridge. It's often called the Haunted Avon Bridge because of the number of accounts of ghost sightings and constant sounds of the moans and screams heard from the ghosts that haunt the bridge. In at number two, we have James Allison Mansion. 
The James Allison Mansion was built for James Allison and it was a dream home, done in a grand design and style that exhibited James's wealth and importance. James was an important figure in the auto and plane industry, greatly helping in the development of cars and airplanes. He founded the Presto Light Company, which produced the first efficient headlight for early automobiles and was a founding partner in Carl Fisher's Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He also started Allison Engineering Company, which evolved and transformed into an aircraft engine make, known today as the Allison Division of Rolls Royce. James purchased the 65 acre estate and he and his wife Sarah built this glorious mansion, starting construction in 1911 and finishing in 1913. The massive home had an elevator, a billiard room, an indoor pool in the basement, a breakfast room, a library, a grand kitchen, and even pumped in ice water. 15 years after the Allisons built their forever home, James then fell in love with his secretary, and he divorced his wife Sarah in 1928. Only a month later, James married this former employee, Lucille Musset. However, James contracted a fatal case of pneumonia and died shortly after marrying his second wife at the age of 56. In 1936, the estate went up for sale, and that same year it was bought by Sisters of St. Francis of Oldenburg. The former Allison home became a home for the college's library, administrative offices, classrooms, and sleeping quarters for the sisters. There have been many things seen and heard throughout the years since it became a college. There was a girl who had drowned in the pool in the basement, and James's untimely death in the home. Both people could be haunting this mansion to this day. It's said that people who pass through a sudden accident or a bout of illness, sometimes their spirits hang around, perhaps unaware that they have died or not wanting to accept their deaths. And this is the case for both the little girl and James. The entity of a little girl is often seen throughout the mansion. There are strange cries that are heard from the basement. In the attic, an object seem to move by themselves and can completely disappear. There is another entity seen and could possibly be more than one, and they like to take keys and objects and move them to odd places. The library in particular is often completely rearranged, like the books and furniture. And finally, in at number one, we have French Lick Springs Hotel. Nestled in the small resort town of French Lick sits the massive French Lick Springs Hotel. This legendary hotel was constructed in 1845 and is a crown jewel of the southern Indiana town. But there's more to this resort than meets the eye. This Indiana hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in the state. Thomas Taggart was a mayor at the time and purchased the hotel in 1888. After purchasing the hotel, he added luxurious furnishings, marble floors, and built two championship golf courses. During this time, Taggart became the Democratic National Chairman, and the hotel became the unofficial headquarters of the Democratic National Party. In 1931, Franklin Roosevelt visited the hotel because of its Democratic standing and won the presidency a mere year later. Over the years, the hotel and the work Taggart put into it made it one of the most prominent hotels in the area and even ran the West Baden Springs Hotel out of the business. Unfortunately, in 1916, Taggart passed away, but according to local legend, his spirit has never left the building. Taggart died in 1916, but that hasn't stopped rumors of sightings of this famous hotel owner. Guests and employees frequently encounter strange and paranormal activity throughout the hotel, and they believe it is caused by Taggart himself. Many spot his ghostly figure near the service elevator and can pick up a strong scent of pipe tobacco. Others claim they witnessed his spirit riding down the hallway on a horse and making noise inside the ballroom. Some hear noises and others encounter his ghost, though usually both don't occur at the same time. Not only is Taggart's ghost living in the hotel, but there are also rumors of a former bellhop that lingers around the hotel. Many believed that he was a current employee until they saw old photos of him hanging on the wall or were told no bellhops were on duty when people had encountered him. Employees and guests say that it's pretty hard not to encounter some sort of activity when you're in the hotel, and due to the vast amount of paranormal sightings and why it's considered by many to be the most haunted place in Indiana and one of the most haunted places in all of the United States. Number 5 on this list is the Seelbach Hotel. Seelbach Hotel is located in the heart of Louisville and has been there for quite some time. Virginia Travel Tip says, In 1905, the Seelbach Hotel in Louisville opened its doors. For more than a century, this exquisite historic hotel has functioned as one of Kentucky's most important historical landmarks. The hotel, on the other hand, is notorious for its ghostly activity. Patricia Wilson, the Lady in Blue, is one of the hotel's most famous sightings. She was a woman who had recently divorced her spouse and intended to meet him later at Sealback to try and work out their differences. Unfortunately, her husband died in a car accident and never showed up. She was devastated 
devastated by the loss and she died not long after that. As a result, guests notice a woman in a blue outfit strolling around the hotel. Other ghosts have been reported at the hotel and they include a woman dressed in old worn out clothing who was approached by a staff member attempting to communicate with her, but then she disappeared. Most of the encounters with this woman have been tame, but there have been some that have gotten quite aggressive. Some teenagers were apparently making fun of her or doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, and she responded by literally clawing and scratching at one of them, leaving horrible marks behind. The victim also said that it felt as if she crawled into his brain and told him horrible secrets about himself that he'll never be able to forget. A hotel like this is supposed to be nice and relaxing, but based on what I've read, I don't know if that's going to be the experience you get at Sealbach. Number 4 on this list is the Talbot Tavern. Really too bad that this place is haunted because it would have been a pretty nice spot to get a brew if it wasn't. Virginia Travel Tip says, built in 1778, the Talbot Tavern is located in Bardstown, Kentucky. Currently, the Haunted Kentucky Tavern serves as both a restaurant and a 5 room B&B and it's known for being haunted. A former accountant recalls coming across a man in a long coat strolling across the top floor. He then turned to face her and began laughing uncontrollably. Another famous hotel resident was the lady in white who forced a couple to flee the hotel in the middle of the night since she was hovering over them while sleeping. Many workers and visitors to the residence have related accounts such as orbs floating around the rooms, flashes of lights without cameras being seen, objects moving on their own, and doors opening and closing when no one's in the building. I, for one, am not trying to wake up to a ghost just hovering over me, guys. Honestly, it might give me a heart attack and, well, I'd never wake up again. This place is weird because no one really knows why it's as haunted as it is, but there's no doubt that it's teeming with paranormal energy. Pick a different place to go get a drink if you're in Kentucky. Number three on this list is the Kentucky State Penitentiary. We always got to include the creepy jail in one of these lists, guys, and this is Kentucky's. Virginia Travel Tips says, the Kentucky State Penitentiary is situated near the Tennessee border on a sharp bend in the Cumberland River. In the 1800s, a maximum security jail was built there. It is a gorgeous place from afar, but up close, it is a death and ghost machine, according to a local author and paranormal investigator. Thousands of men have been executed in the prison's electric chair, known as Old Sparky. During his death row cell inspections in the late 1980s, a guard had a terrible incident where no one stayed. He was greeted by a prisoner who was reading the Bible. When he returned to his office, he asked about the prisoner's meal, only to discover that no one was in that cell. When he returned to the cell, he discovered that it was empty except for a small Bible on the floor. Yeah, kind of weird. More strange occurrences were recorded around the institution, with many reporting seeing a reflection of an inmate who attempted to shock them. Okay, so honestly guys, I want to take this as seriously as possible, but Old Sparky? Like imagine dying in a thing called Old Sparky. Like I think it's meant to electrocute people, but why does the killing chair sound so cute? Kinda sounds like something that you name your dog, not a murder weapon. Anyways, Old Sparky has certainly done its job though, and now the place is super haunted. Most of the prisons we talk about on this channel you can go visit if you like, because they're all typically abandoned. That's not the case with this one though. The Kentucky State Penitentiary is still fully operational and has tons of prisoners in it. Not only do these people have to chill in jail, but it just so happens that their jail is also haunted. Number two on this list is Mammoth Cave. So we actually spoke about Mammoth Cave on this channel before in our series about top five terrifying caves where evil awaits. So if that interests you, then go check it out. It made that list because it was super haunted and naturally it has to make this one as well. It is, as you'd expect, located in Kentucky. It is the biggest cave in the state by far, which is why it's named Mammoth Cave. Most of the cave has been unexplored, which is kind of nuts considering we've already seen about 400 miles of it up until this point. This has been an area of interest to people for thousands of years. Back 4,000 years ago, it's believed that people used this cave to bury their dead. This was the first encounter this cavern saw of death, but it definitely wasn't the last. 
After the War of 1812, these caves were sold off and used as a place to mine salt. The workers of these mines were slaves and oftentimes were worked to death down there. After the salt had been mined, this place functioned as a spot for sick tuberculosis victims to go. Obviously, this created more death in this place and just contributed to what is a very haunted area now. Today, we get an array of ghostly apparitions popping up to people. Ghosts from all the way back 4,000 years ago have been seen, still lingering and clinging onto this cavern. People have seen the visions of slaves calling out for help and ghosts of sickly individuals as well. H.P. Lovecraft, one of the most famous fantasy horror writers, was inspired by this cave. Anything that inspired that guy is probably a spot that you want to avoid. And finally, number one on this list is Nata Tunnel. What is it about tunnels that's just so creepy? It feels like there are a few locations in the world that seem to attract paranormal activity and tunnels are definitely right up there. Virginia Travel Tip says, Nata Tunnel, also known as the Gateway to Red River Gorge, is located in Powell County, Kentucky. Works of a one-lane tunnel on a two-way road began in 1910 and concluded in 1911. Drills and dynamite were used to rip through the limestone rock during construction and one worker died while attempting to dissolve a stick of frozen dynamite by placing it next to the fire which, you know, resulted in the dynamite exploding. As a result, the man's spirit is claimed to haunt the Kentucky Tunnel. Others allege that the location is haunted as a result of a climber who died in this region. These incidents are linked to the mythology of a green orb appearing in front of the tunnel. If you plan to enter the tunnel, keep in mind that it only fits one automobile at a time, therefore check for other car headlights before proceeding. This is one of the coolest haunted places in Kentucky for the sake of it being engulfed in nature. So it may look really cool, but the haunted nature of this spot makes me think that it should be avoided. Man, imagine literally getting blown up by a stick of dynamite, like that might actually be the worst. Granted, my dude did stick the dynamite literally right next to a fire, so I feel like he might have brought this one on himself a little bit. I'm not really sure how the climber would have died in this tunnel, but you got to imagine that he screwed up if he was climbing in a tunnel. Either way, the spot is definitely riddled with these spirits and they manifest themselves as this glowing green orb. Now, there haven't been too many reports of this thing being super dangerous, but it is definitely creepy to say the least. Locals don't really travel down this pathway for fear of the orb and what it could potentially do to them. Also, on a total side note, I just want to bring up the fact that this is a one-way tunnel on a two-lane road. Like, how dangerous is that, guys? What if it's foggy or something and I can't see all the way down the tunnel to the other car? That is literally the dumbest road design I have ever heard of. Maybe the legend was just created by the locals because they know how dangerous this freaking tunnel is. Regardless of what it is, I recommend staying away. Number five on this list is the Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. Most haunted museums or anything like that are all kind of phony and corny. This one though, this isn't for the faint of heart. Thrillist says, when Zach Baggins opened the Haunted Museum in Las Vegas, he did his homework and picked the creepiest place possible. The attraction is inside an old Victorian home that dates back to 1938. It was owned by a family haunted by a child who died due to surgical complications. Later, when the home was vacant, intruders broke in and held satanic rituals in the basement. Adult actress Jenna Jameson actually grew up in the house and swears the stories are true, but doesn't like to talk about it too much. Today, you can take a guided tour of the Haunted Museum, frequently used as a filming location for Baggins' ghost adventures on the Travel Channel and Discovery+. Plus. The museum packs a lot into one visit with more than 30 rooms. Things start off relatively tame with a look at spooky artifacts and a gambling parlor in a closet full of creepy dolls. But the pace picks up with exhibits dedicated to notorious serial killers, an up-close look at a Volkswagen van used as a death machine by Jack Kevorkian, and a haunted hallway of killer clowns. 
It's best not to give away too many spoilers, but at one point you'll face an item described as the most haunted object in the whole world. You will even get to explore the basement at some point, which many people believe to still be extremely haunted. You gotta wonder why the heck so many horrible things happened here. Haunted child, satanic rituals, other questionable things that have probably not been linked to the public. I guess it makes sense to have a haunted museum here, but obviously bringing in all of these other haunted items has just further promoted paranormal energy and now this is clearly a hotspot for spirits and ghosts alike. Only go to this museum if you can handle a good scare. Number 4 on this list is Rhyolite Ghost Town. This abandoned town is full of scary spirits, ghouls, and maybe a lot more. Thrillist says, take a short road trip out of Las Vegas and spend the afternoon exploring the ruins of Rhyolite, one of the most compelling ghost towns in the country. A hub of mining activity during the gold rush, the town was quickly abandoned when the boom went bust following the panic of 1907. Wander around and you'll see the scattered remains of a bank, jail, and train depot. The landscape looks more like a nuclear war zone than a ghost town, but just as sinister and perhaps still home to the spirits who once lived there many years ago. We have talked a ton about ghost towns on this channel before. Something about ghost towns seems to attract spirits. Maybe like the sudden absence of people leaves a void that these spirits seem to want to fill. It also doesn't help the situation when you have people doing some very questionable things at these ghost towns. Considering they are totally abandoned and out of the way, ghost towns make for some pretty good places to have some covert meetings and deals go down. This one in Las Vegas, it's no different. Apparently a decent amount of criminal activity happens around here with a lot of drug deals taking place here. Every now and again these deals can go sour and usually that leaves a body. Murder and a gang presence aren't great things to sprinkle in when a town is already dealing with paranormal activity. For safety purposes, I recommend staying away from this town at all costs. Number 3 on this list is West Gate. So I am actually breaking the rules with this one a little bit because I think that you should definitely visit this place if you have the money. Thrillist says, some Las Vegas residencies never quite end. Elvis Presley redefined what it meant to be a superstar entertainer in this town with more than 600 shows over 7 years at the International Hotel which became the Las Vegas Hilton and is now the Westgate. The property continues to honor the king with a statue in the hotel lobby. Although Elvis passed away in Memphis, some believe his soul remains in Vegas with his ghost haunting the Westgate International Theater and a lavish rooftop villa the singer called home whenever he was in town. It's not cheap, but you can book the penthouse yourself. Just call the desk and ask for the Elvis suite. I don't care how creepy it may be or how scary he would look, but if there is an opportunity to see the ghost of Elvis, then that is absolutely something that I definitely want to cash in on. Imagine you pull up to your hotel room after a night of drinking and then you get to have a late night conversation with one of the greatest rock stars of all time ever. I don't think that Elvis would be the type of dude to hurt you or anything like that even in ghost form. So as long as it's safe to do so, count me the heck in dude. I want to go to Vegas and party with the ghost of Elvis. Number 2 on this list is Las Vegas Academy of the Arts. As somebody who graduated university for acting and art school being haunted is just a tad bit triggering. Thrillist says the Las Vegas Academy of the Arts is a magnet school that specializes in music, theater, and other fine arts. Yet its legacy dates back to 1931 when it was known simply as Las Vegas High School, the first official high school in Las Vegas. The site has seen its share of renovations over the years, although two of its three original buildings remain on campus with their sturdy brick exteriors still in place. Generations of students have swapped stories about Mr. Petrie, a ghost that roams the hallways and haunts the school's theater. Some claim to hear strange noises or feel a chill, especially when rehearsals carry over to evening hours. So who is Mr. Petrie? 
Some believe he was a former teacher. Others claim he owned a home that previously stood on the site of the school and burned down in a mysterious fire. Nobody knows for sure. All everyone does know is that Mr. Petrie is a menace. Let me tell you folks, acting is hard enough as it is without some creepy ghost causing problems for you mid monologue. And apparently he likes to do that all the time. Many shows and performances have been ruined by Mr. Petrie. And the worst part about it is that he will only show himself to one person at a time sometimes. So the lead actor will be out there doing Hamlet and then all of a sudden see a ghost in front of him causing problems. The actor will naturally freak out and lose their mind, but no one else will see the ghost, they'll just see the actor on stage losing it. Which kind of makes the actor look like a bumbling idiot, but really they're getting attacked by some ghost. Try a different art school if you're looking for an artistic education. Number one on this list is Bollies. If Trivago or any other site like that tries to recommend you stay at Bollies, don't fall for it guys. Thrillist says the worst fire in Nevada history tore through the old MGM Grand Hotel on November 21st, 1980. The blaze killed 87 people, mostly due to smoke inhalation, while helicopters rescued survivors from the roof. The property was eventually sold and renamed Bollies, while a new version of the MGM Grand reopened a few blocks south on the Strip. The tower engulfed in the fire is still part of the hotel, and guests sometimes claim to see unusual shadows in hallways, hear strange noises, and notice furniture that mysteriously moves in the rooms, especially on higher floors that saw the worst of the flames. Many believe the strange activity is caused by the spirits of those who didn't survive the tragedy. 87 people dying in a tragedy like that is always going to leave something terrible behind and that's what we have here. 87 spirits are now restlessly floating around in purgatory at this place. They tried to remodel and change the name and forget everything that happened, but an incident like that cannot be forgotten. The people who died and their spirits, they can't be forgotten. They're still there to this day haunting the place and trying to seek help. Many of the reports haven't talked about these ghosts being evil, but just being misunderstood and trying to get out of this place. They didn't ask to die in a fire and they also didn't ask to be left in this purgatory place forever. I would imagine that they want to move on, they just don't know how to get free of this. Hopefully someone can figure out a way to save these souls and let them pass on for good. Kicking off the list at number five, the Landmark Inn. Located in the upper peninsula of Michigan, right around Lake Superior, you'll find the Landmark Inn. Yeah, nice and cute and cozy. Come on in, take your coat off, stay a while. This fancy hotel was originally built in 1930 as a luxury accommodation for wealthy business owners from all around the United States. Sounds like a good time, let's gather, let's talk, let's talk shop around candles. These business owners would visit at the landmark to check on their business interests, all that good stuff. Though for its 100 years being open to guests, the hotel has had multiple reports of, you guessed it, ghosts and paranormal activity. It's so common at the Landmark Inn that the ghost hunters and paranormal investigators, they make trips out to the hotel quite often just to check in and be like, hey, how's it going? And they put on their gadgets and they just check in on them. They can rely on them. The hotel's sixth floor is home to one of the saddest stories the hotel has ever seen. This story takes place in the 1930s when the hotel was a new, lively social and cultural center in town. The the story revolves around a ship worker who fell in love with a local librarian and conducted their love affair in the lilac room. Yeah, of all places, of course, let's go meet the lilac room. Sounds beautiful. And that was where the man was staying. Perfect place to meet. The couple was said to have a planned wedding upon his return from the last voyage on the sometimes treacherous Lake Superior. Unfortunately, their love affair ended in tragedy when his ship met with a storm and sank to the bottom of a lake. He never returned to the shore and the librarian mourned the man in said lilac room, eventually dying herself of a broken heart. The heartbreaking story comes with many reports of the lilac room now being haunted. Yeah, rightfully so. As a large number of guests has reported hearing cries and whispers from a female. The female is also seen by many guests and workers on the sixth floor near the lilac room, crying and mourning for her loved one. A less romantic story that is associated with the hotel goes back to when it was even finished being built. During construction, a man ended the life of his girlfriend due to anger and jealousy. And this took place right after she told him about her past boyfriends and their relationship history. Just normal stuff that he flipped out on, just a monster. And since the hotel was still being built to conceal the evidence, the 
men buried her in the unfinished basement. Just horrible stuff. You knew I was going there and you're like, ah, oh, please don't. To this day, decades later, visitors and employees report hearing cries from that basement and some report hearing whispers from a female voice asking for them to find her body. I just got goosebumps. That's real goosebumps. No matter how much time goes by, these two women, heartbroken for different reasons, still haunt said hotel today. Number four, Michigan Bell Telephone Building. The Bell Telephone Building can be found in downtown Grand Rapids. It's known from the legend that the building is haunted by two ghosts. It's always two, eh? I always gotta have pairs. Good things come in pairs, even demons. These spirits have consistently caused chaos throughout the buildings for years in their own unique personal way. We love it, we love a unique ghost. The spirits that haunt the Bell Building are rumored to be Warren and Virginia Randall, a couple who used to reside in the Grand Rapids. Back in 1907, they moved from Detroit and bought the Judd White Mansion in Grand Rapids, which has now been torn down and built into what we now know as the Bell Telephone Building. So a lot of history there already. Over the years of living in this new house, Warren and Virginia's relationship started to crumble as Warren became very strange and paranoid almost, creating hardships in their relationship. In 1908, Virginia became tired of Warren's strange and aggressive behavior, so she decided, I'm out of here, peace. She left him. One night, three years after they were separated, Warren convinced Virginia into taking a car ride with them, you know, hoping to get back together, maybe talk it out. The two of them ended up at the Judd White House where their verbal disagreement turned horrible and Warren sadly took the life of Virginia. Then he proceeded to end his own life in the very same moment. The tragic accident that happened in the Judd White House became public knowledge and the house was left empty with no one wanting to occupy it. Yeah, more than fair. I'm like, what's rent? Also, what happened? No. The house remained abandoned for 10 years after the accident it until they finally just decided to tear the thing down completely. Thus in 1924 they built the Bell Telephone Building on the ground which still is in operation today. Yeah, they didn't tear that one down, that one's still going strong. Due to the horrifying scenes that happened on the grounds of the Bell Building, many claims that the spirits of Randall and Virginia still remain, haunting the new building. Some say the ghosts move into the new building and remain there to this day. I mean, I think that's possible. Ghosts like to move, they like to they can go through walls, they can probably relocate. Through the years of operation in the office building, visitors and employees all report being harassed by strange late night calls, which have been traced back to be coming from inside of the building itself. Yeah, inside the house, you guessed it, it's upstairs, that's so scary. Due to this and the strange eerie feelings that the employees feel while they're even working, it's safe to say Randall and Virginia may remain on the grounds, most likely, they're, they're definitely there. It sounds like they're there, they're for sure there. Number three, the Henderson Castle. Established in 1895, this castle is a hub for many spirits in paranormal activity. I mean, it's a castle. The original owners, Frank and Mary Henderson, are said to haunt the castle as they passed away back in 1899. Yeah, I wouldn't want to leave either, living or dead. Additionally, other spirits are said to reside in the castle, a young girl and a dog. Yeah, a dog, we've got a dog ghost. How do you deal with that? Ghost barks? That'd be so scary. In 2005, the castle was occupied by Peter Livingstone McNellis and his family. When the family resided in the castle, Livingstone's son, Vincent, before anyone else had ever reported anything strange happening in the house, he said that he saw an apparition of a figure in the Victorian room. Originally, the changing room for one Mary Henderson. The son said while pointing at a picture of a woman dressed in an old period clothing, some Victorian clothing, that that was the woman he saw wearing that same clothing. I would throw up. If someone ever said that, I'd be like, oh, this Victorian painting? And one former innkeeper who stayed at the castle each night told Livingstone on numerous occasions that she also felt a presence coming up and down the staircase. A movement passing her on the stairs when she would walk by. Ugh, these are scary. Top five is like, you know, or top 10 is scary fish. This is, this is hard. This is some scary stuff. 9 a.m. I'm already getting spooked. While now the castle is being used for a bed and breakfast, guests have fallen victim to ghosts as well. Yeah, it's not over yet. The Henderson Castle is a very paranormal active ground that many ghost hunters have investigated and they've confirmed, in fact, that it's haunted by spirits. I trust them. The people that can go into these castles and physically do this, I'm like, yep, I trust your opinion, whatever. He just comes out, he's like, haunted. We're like, thanks, Daryl. This has been confirmed as these ghosts have interacted with many paranormal investigator teams in addition to guests and employees of the castle. Yeah, there's and everyone. The ghosts seem to be friendly, not evil whatsoever, so that's a good side, I guess, to being uh, haunted by ghosts. They have been known to speak and physically touch guests and employees. Just, they touch them on their back, side, shoulder. Always in the back, never see it coming. It's always in, always in this region. Not only that, but there's also been reports of radios making weird noises or turning on by themselves, even though they're either unplugged or just either turned off. Both bad, both scary. Guests and employees have also reported hearing footsteps upstairs, slamming doors from unexplainable sources, and some ghosts have been wearing the clothes that they wore while they were alive. Clothes that they wore while they died in, probably. As the spirit of Mary Henderson has been reported as many guests at the top of the staircase, wearing her usual getup. Imagine being like a clown, like a jester, and then you die in that, and that's what you look like as a ghost. 
You're like, what? I was doing a mascot gig. I don't look like a shark forever. Number two, Elegant Hodge. The old Elegant Elk Lodge was built in 1909. It was used as a psychiatric and TB hospital until its closure in 1948. The lodge was a former hospital that was frequented by mobster Al Capone and one that many say is haunted by at least seven different ghosts. Yeah, you thought, you thought two was bad. Add five more, now we got seven ghosts. And it's currently on the auction block in Allegan. If you have a lot of money and bravery, there you go. While the structure was originally built by physician John Robinson in 1909, somewhere in the 1920s, it was sold to a doctor from the Chicago area who had allegedly had underworld ties. That's a great doctor. You got just who you want working on your pancreas. Brought pancreas back today. The facility was supposedly frequented by mafia figures such as Al Capone, the Prohibition era Chicago mob boss, and his men. Yeah, well, they needed medical attention or when they simply needed to get away from Chicago, this is where they'd go. The, the old Elks Lodge, Al Capone. He's like, oh, it's cozy. They have great soup. <laughs> Years later, it was used as an Eagles Lodge and an Elks Lodge. And in 2010, it was acquired by an elegant woman who began renovating the property, but now she wants to sell it. Yeah, can't imagine why. Because one of the former doctors who owns a lodge had underworld ties, maybe? Something like that? I don't know. It led to a lot of people believing that there's a lot of undercover stuff about this lodge. It's still happening to this day. I don't know why I'm doing this like it's like over there, but I'm like, there's something going on in that lodge. Especially as it's known to hold seven different paranormal entities, like I mentioned previously. For many years, employees and visitors have told stories of spirits who relentlessly roam the building. Some of the paranormal activity that has been experienced here includes cabinets opening up by themselves in the kitchen, sounds of children laughing, it's always calming in the morning, photographic anomalies captured throughout the building, and like you name it, shadowy figures in the basement, all bad. Notably where the morgue was located, the basement, good stuff, a lot of, a lot of stuff happening in there. There'd be knocking on the front door, indiscernible conversations, and ringing at the doorbell when no one was present. Yeah, good stuff. Again, I have, uh, I have goosebumps, they're back. Guests also heard footsteps and the sound of hospital activity long after being used as one. They'd also see full-bodied apparitions of, uh, of children. They would just see ghost children. That would be it. I wouldn't have to see any more. I would just see the ghost children and be like, Again, see ya. Like that's. And finally, number one, point oh, Barks Lighthouse. There are plenty of lighthouses in Michigan, and plenty of them are rumored to be haunted, of course, because they're lighthouses and they're creepy, as they normally are. And this one is no exception. Built in 1847, real old, real, a lot of history with this one. The lighthouse is located on point oh, Barks. As the legend goes, early to mid 1800s, Peter Shook had been point oh, Barks' first lighthouse keeper. He was the OG. In 1849, Peter drowned while he and a couple of friends were sailing to Port Huron to pick up supplies for the lighthouse. He left behind eight kids and his wife, Catherine, and she took over at that point for Peter's duties, thus becoming Michigan's first female lighthouse keeper. Since then, people have claimed to see the spirit of Catherine walking along the edge of a cliff dressed in mourning clothes as she is still heartbroken by the loss of her lover, of course. As we talked about earlier, ghosts like to wear the things that they were, you know, that they passed away in. Again, would hate to be a clown outfit. That would suck. She had also been spotted in the window of the second floor wearing an apron, along with an apparition being seen, footsteps ascending and descending the tower stairs, and giggling has also been heard. Yeah, you hear giggling and there's cold spots, therefore haunted, for sure haunted. And the smell of burnt tobacco has also been wafting through the air many a times. Lighthouses are pretty stressful, more than fair. My paranormal investigators, specifically the Southeast Michigan Paranormal Society team, when they had a two-day intensive investigation after their search, they concluded that they believe that there's every reason for the lighthouse to be haunted. The investigators did some electric voice phenomenon work in the living room, and then they heard loud thuds from overheard. Like, where do they get this gear from, you know? Like, I, I want this gear. I have some questions of myself going on in the apartment. I want to swing it around a bit. A sound of something scraping along the floor as well, and additionally, during their investigation, the rocking chair had moved two feet and was still moving. Just love to keep rocking around. We love that. We love haunted rocking chairs. We love unexplainable forces. While they were upstairs, they also reported hearing heavy footsteps from another unknown source. So, many ghosts, there's rocking chairs, people moving around, working in the basement. It doesn't sound like the afterlife is a peaceful one, but being honest, sounds like there's a lot of to do after you die. I'm not really looking forward to it. I thought I could just kind of float around near paintings, but now it sounds like I'm gonna have to go and wear this. Wear my morning clothes, who knows? In at number five, we have Palmer House Hotel. This hotel is not only considered the most haunted place in Minnesota, but to some, it's considered the most haunted place in America. Located in South Center, the hotel has been visited by paranormal activity investigators from across the country. Recently, the ghost hunter from the Travel Channel, Ghost Adventures, even investigated the hotel. A brothel that went by the name of the South Center House occupied the current grounds of the Palmer Hotel, but the South Center House burned down in 19. 
1900, and the Palmer was built in its place the following year. The Palmer Hotel was established in 1901 and is notorious for its permanent ghost residence. The most reported ghost in the hotel is named Lucy, who resides in room 17. Legend has it that Lucy was an adult worker that frequented the past building of the Salk Center house. Though Lucy endured a terrible accident of losing her life at the hands of one of her clients, even though this happened in the building, the Palmer Hotel can't seem to get rid of the spirit of Lucy. The ghost of Lucy is said to dislike men by slamming the room door at male guests. Some reports her slamming the room door so hard it rattles the artwork on the wall and aggressively drops the temperature. During a recent investigation, a Chicago ghost hunting outfit allegedly recorded a temperature of negative 1 degrees Fahrenheit during their stay. Additionally, there was a couple staying at the hotel that reported a horrifying ghost encounter in room 17, where the wife woke up in the night and suddenly saw a lanky man dressed in 1920s clothing, standing at the foot of the bed. Other active areas include the bar in room 22, home to a spirit named Raymond, rumoured to be Lucy's manager. One employee of the Palmer House Hotel has confessed that their favourite paranormal experience is when guests complain about how noisy the people above them are, even though they are on the top floor. The ghost encounters and paranormal activity is so frequent at the Palmer Hotel that the current owner, Kelly Freezer, didn't believe in ghosts, but this changed when she became the owner of the hotel. In at number 4 we have the Soap Factory. The Soap Factory was at its peak during the soap boom of the 1880s, though now the factory has been left abandoned. The Soap Factory is one of the oldest factories in Minneapolis. While the process of making soap required lots of fats, lie in extremely hot temperatures, therefore it wasn't the most glorious or safest workplace in its day. Furthermore, the fats came from animal carcasses, thousands of them. The flow of blood and skin leaked into the Great River next door in the turn of the century. The building smell of flesh made it the hot spot for stray dogs that the city paid to be rounded up and sent to the end of their life. If that's not creepy enough, there are legends regarding malpractice taking place at the factory, with animal fats from local restaurants taken to be made into soap. And there were also rumours of child labour at the factory, but whatever you choose to believe, there is no denying that the site contains negative energy. Now the basement of the abandoned factory is used for haunted tours. The tour is so scary in fact that guests have to sign a waiver and have to be 18 to go on the tour. In at number 3 we have First Avenue. Located in downtown Minneapolis, the building which is now home to this nightclub has a rounded front, is painted black and has white stars on its side walls with the names of many of the musical talents who have done shows in one of these three event rooms found inside. Before it was famous for being a nightclub, the First Avenue was a Greyhound Depot. The First Avenue legend has to do with the building's former self, the Great Art Deco Greyhound Bus Center that opened on 7th Street in 1937. The story goes that a young woman went to the station to meet her boyfriend who was returning home from World War II. When she was informed that he had died in combat, she ran into the restroom and ended her life due to heartbreak. In recent years, multiple First Avenue staffers have reported seeing a ghost in the washroom. The ghost has been reportedly described as a woman always in a green army jacket and sometimes seen dancing at the club along with other ghosts. Legend says that many homeless people died in the bus station as well and they can be seen dancing with the women. There have been reports of another spirit haunting the nightclub. The staffers nicknamed this spirit Slip. While this particular ghost is said to make a balloon appear from nowhere, which then floats up and down the staircase on its own. Dave Schrade, a paranormal investigator, visited First Avenue to assess the paranormal activity in the building multiple times and has concluded that the building is indeed haunted by many spirits, indicating that the record room is the most active area of the site. While DJs that have played at the venue have reported frequently hearing strange noises through their headphones, such as growls, voices, and screams, other performers report their equipment being pushed off stage with no experience. Explanation. In at number 2 we have Schmidt Brewery. Schmidt Brewery became the largest in Minnesota by 1860, producing 1200 barrels annually and shipping them as far south as Tennessee. It was restructured as the St. Paul Brewing Company in 1898 before being sold to Jacob Schmidt soon after in 1900. Since its opening in 1884, many ghost hunters have visited the Schmidt Brewery to experience some of the many rumoured paranormal activities. The brewery has been the site of many constant unexplainable instances, from fires to people losing their lives to terrible accidents, this place has seen a lot of scary sights. While the victims of these events linger around to haunt the grounds of the brewery, even though the building is now used as an artist's loft, that doesn't take away the scary history of the Schmidt Brewery. While most of the ghosts that haunt the grounds of the old brewery have to do with ordinary brewery workers dying in terrible accidents, in 1896 two workers lost their lives in an explosion. Furthermore, in 1902 a worker fell down an unmarked elevator shaft. Additionally, in 1904, Matthew Kohler, a worker whose job was to light gas lamps in the brewery lost his life from inhaling flames. Schmidt Brewery has been a St. Paul haunt 
silent since 1855 for more than a couple of reasons. When owner Jacob Schmidt took down the original North Star Brewery sign, replacing it with his namesake, Jacob Schmidt Brewing Company. The entire brewery burned down a year later in 1900. Plenty of other bad luck would also follow on the grounds of the brewery, suspected due to the tragic death of many workers of the brewery. And finally, in at number one, we have Four Pals Restaurant. Known as the most haunted restaurant in Minnesota, the Four Pal has a tragic story. Located in St. Paul, Four Pals was a high end restaurant located in Irvine Park, and the restaurant is a beautiful Victorian mansion. Sadly, though, the restaurant is now permanently closed. The dark stories about Four Pals Restaurant hint that the historic mansion is seriously haunted. As the story goes, back in the late 1800s, Joseph Four Pal had an affair with the mansion's maid, Molly. It was not long before his wife discovered this relationship and love for Mary. Therefore, the wife became extremely jealous of the servant and assigned Molly to do chores that would keep her away from the bedrooms and away from Joseph. Molly became pregnant and Joseph ended the affair, but Molly was so distraught about the whole situation that she ended her life. According to reports, she ended her life in the attic. Joseph was upset when he heard the news about Molly that he figured he could not stay in the house where his beloved died. One day he went out for a walk and ended his life as well. Since then, restaurant guests and employees have reported creepy sightings of a woman dressed in 1800s attire, lights turning off and on by themselves, and strange noises coming from the attic. In one case, the disturbances were so chaotic that it led to an investigation by the St. Paul police, whose canine dog refused to enter the attic. It is said that Joseph and Molly both haunt four pals, but many guests have said Molly is more active spirit. People say they have seen the two walking around the dining area, but Molly bangs on walls and smashes glasses. Some people say they can smell her lavender perfume. That being said, Mr. Four Pal is also sometimes seen, and his ghost has been reported wearing a dark waistcoat, silk vest, pinstripe trousers, and a derby hat. He can be seen going to the basement at which time the lights flicker and shuffling noises are heard. He roams the house and has been caught on film many times. The former staff of the restaurant have also reported on many occasions when they would go floor by floor turning off lights as they close down for the night. Then when the staff members get in their cars to leave, they'll notice the top floor light is on. Nevertheless, if the restaurant is haunted, the story of Mr. Forpau and Molly is one of the most devastating to date. Number 5 on this list is the Carolina Inn. This inn has actually been voted one of the most haunted in America by a few different lists. The University of North Carolina says the Carolina Inn was built in 1924 and quickly became a popular hotel for visitors and graduates of the university. In 1948, the Carolina Inn's most long-lasting guests checked in and apparently never left. Dr. William Jacox was a fun-loving man with a witty sense of humor, had recently retired from practicing medicine, and decided to make the Carolina Inn his final home. He lived in room 252 for 17 years before his death in 1965. As shared by the Carolina Inn, guests that have stayed in Jacox's old room report being inexplicably locked out of the suite. One time, the lock was so stubborn that a workman had to use a ladder to break into the room. Visitors have also noticed strange occurrences such as messy bath mats and previously closed curtains being pulled wide open. Some have encountered the smell of freshly cut flowers despite none being in the room and felt their bodies become strangely cold for no apparent reason. This is only part of the stuff that goes down at this room as well guys. Some people have reported seeing a poorly dressed man approach them looking for an unlocked door and then if they show it to him, he runs away screaming. It's thought that this is the ghost of Dr. William Jacox. I don't know why unlocked doors scare this dude so much, but anyone who's gonna spend 17 years in this hotel is probably a bit of a weird dude. Unless you want to deal with a crazy old doctor ghost messing with you all vacation, I'd stay at a different inn. Number 4 on this list is the New Hanover County Library. I don't know why guys, but something about haunted libraries is just so intriguing to me. Like it just seems so mystical and mysterious I guess. This haunted library is located right in Wilmington. There is a woman that haunts this place who is believed to be a patron. Apparently she used to donate quite generously to this library and in death doesn't want to leave it behind. She isn't the only ghost that walks the halls here and haunts the books. There is a male poltergeist who makes his presence quite known as well. He apparently died in a duel that happened here many years ago, 
before this land was turned into a library. Nowadays, these two ghosts make it very hard to do any serious learning or studying considering they haunt the place so much. The woman isn't too bad, she just shows up and looks super creepy, but from my reading, she only actually punishes those who cause harm to the library or make fun of it. Those who come here to learn and to read, she leaves them be for the most part. The man, however, is certainly quite the pest. He often messes with those that come here and makes it very difficult for people to accomplish anything. I love libraries, I think that we should all go to them more often, but maybe just not this one specifically. Number three on this list is Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was a critical fort during the American Civil War. It was used by the Confederate Army and was pretty instrumental for them from 1861 to 1865. This fort was used to protect an important trade post there that the army needed. They defended this place for those four years, but then in 1865, the Union Army came in and was finally able to capture it. This battle was a very bloody one and was actually huge for the Union Army in the overall scope of the war. Apparently, there was a lot of death at this fort, and that death it's never really gone away. Now this fort is teeming with paranormal activity. Visitors will often report hearing gunshots coming from thin air. The sounds of many footsteps all running at once as if people were charging ahead. Orbs of energy appear in front of them from no apparent source. There are two very famous ghosts that haunt this place as well. Robert E. Harrell and General William Whitling. Robert was apparently an outcast who died under mysterious circumstances and has not been able to rest since. The General was actually taken prisoner and killed at Fort Columbus, but he returned to this place because he feels regret for how he failed in life. He was apparently responsible for defending this place and was not capable of doing so. A very haunted fort that I wouldn't recommend going to. Number two on this list is Lydia's Bridge. Who is Lydia and why does she have a bridge and why is it haunted? Well, Lydia is quite the famous ghost. This is a true ghost. Like when you think of a ghost and a ghost story, this meets all the criteria for a good one. Spectrum Local News says, people traveling between Jamestown and Greensboro on US Highway 70A said they've encountered the ghost of Lydia, a hitchhiker. If she's picked up, she gets into the car and vanishes before she reaches the requested destination. Various versions of the Lydia legend have been passed along over the years, and there are apparently 11 different versions of the story that are set in North North Carolina. It's common for folks to go ghost hunting for Lydia near the bridge. In the book, Looking for Lydia, historians Michael Reniger and Amy Greer cite the 1923 death of Annie C. Johnson as the real life Lydia who died after a car flipped in 1920. That is a story with some history, man. Literally since the 1920s this has been going on and there are 11 different versions of the story. A story like this isn't just made up, it's not just something that one person posted on creepy pasta that became a thing. No, this has been part of the identity of North Carolina for a century. Countless people have picked up this woman and then had her disappear right before their very eyes. Car accidents have happened for people driving this woman and then getting so shocked that they spin off the road when she disappears. Lydia or... Annie is a real ghost who stalks drivers along this road and especially this bridge. Although she isn't inherently evil in nature, as I said before, accidents have happened when people realize they were just driving a ghost around. I have no idea where Lydia is trying to get to, but trust me, you probably don't want to be the person to take her there. And finally, number one on this list is the Devil's Tramping Grounds. This is in reference to a very strange patch of soil in North Carolina. For decades, this circle of dirt has allowed nothing to grow on it at all whilst the area surrounding it is home to luscious wildlife. The Sun Journal says, regional legend maintains that Satan frequents the area on his nightly walks, pacing the circle as he contemplates his nefarious deeds. Normal vegetation surrounds the circle, but only a wiry grass grows inside it and no plant life of any kind can be found on the path itself. Visitors have also claimed to see red glowing eyes in the circle. Now there could be any number of reasons for why nothing is growing on this patch of dirt. Simply because an area of land cannot grow wildlife doesn't automatically mean the devil himself has anything to do with it. But throw in the fact that there are two red glowing eyes there, plus a few other creepy occurrences and we might just have something demonic afoot. Locals have reported putting objects in the center of the circle, then coming back a little while later and having those same items moved outside the circle. 
as if someone or something did this deliberately. The thinking is that this circle is a place used by the devil to dance or to perform rituals that we don't understand. Having things inside his circle of death doesn't make for a great dancing spot or sacrificial zone, so those things need to get moved. That's why we see the red eyes in the night and there's an overwhelming sensation of dread in the area. It's the devil doing his devilish things. A daring reporter actually decided to test this theory one evening and slept in the exact spot in a tent. He said that the entire evening he heard the distinct sounds of dancing footprints outside his tent, but couldn't spot anything when he looked out. My dude literally could have been like one foot away from the actual devil. No idea how he managed to make it through the entire night, but honestly, solid respect. Either way, this guy's story is an exception, not the norm. I'd avoid this place at all costs, because if you don't, the devil might actually make you pay for it. Number 5 in this list is the Thunderbird Youth Academy. The Thunderbird Youth Academy is located in Pryor and is deeply haunted with the ghosts of students who have long passed. Back in 1942, it suffered a horrible tragedy where a lot of the children staying here passed away. Back then it was an orphanage and it was still years before it would become a military school. It got hit hard with a devastating tornado that the building simply wasn't ready for. Tons of the children who lived there perished due to the storm and now their ghosts are set to linger here. Stories where people will wake up in their beds and find literally other children lying in them staring directly at them are far too common. These stories also don't even factor in one of the most famous ghosts there, Hector. Hector is a young boy who haunts the third platoon building. Hector's story is far more graphic than the other children who died. It's not confirmed, but some say that the cook took Hector's life and did it in a fashion that I can't go into detail on YouTube about. Either way, now his spirit forever haunts this building and all of those who reside in it. I personally would never want to go to military school anyways as a kid, but having it be haunted would make it even worse. Number 4 on this list is the Tulsa Theater. It's weird how some places attract ghosts and spirits more than others. Theaters are one of the most prominent spots for paranormal presences, and this theater is no exception. News Oklahoma says, Tulsa Theater, formerly known as Brady Theater, used to be a vaudeville house providing entertainment to audiences. The space went through a lot over the years, including being abandoned and almost destroyed. But after renovations and a name change, the Tulsa Theater reopened. Legend is, the space is haunted by an Italian opera singer named Enrico Caruso. Caruso took in the sights around town while in Tulsa to perform. He wanted to see the oil wells and how they made them, said French. And as they came back, it was raining, it was cold, miserable, and the car broke down. Despite already being sick, Caruso made the journey back on foot in the rain to give what turned out to be his last performance ever. He had a great performance, according to history, French said. It was one of his best, standing ovations in the whole nine yards. Unfortunately, after returning to Italy, Caruso died. French said many say Tulsa caused Caruso's demise and that's why it's believed he haunts the theater. Even Caruso's manager named Tulsa as the reason for his death. But it goes deeper than just Caruso. When it was the Brady Theater, the building is rumored to have played a role in the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. I mean, it played a huge role. It housed some of the victims. There are rumors they died inside and some other horrible things that happened to them, French said. We actually captured electronic video phenomena evidence that almost confirms all of the stories there. The Tulsa Race Massacre was a horrible display of hate and racism. On May 31st in 1921, a bunch of white residents who had been given weapons by city officials attacked a bunch of black residents. This incident lasted over 24 hours and saw more than 800 people get injured and at least 36 people die. A horrifying tragedy that never should have occurred. It's no wonder that any place tied to this incident could be haunted. Number 3 on this list is the Hex House. Yeah, that's right guys, this place is literally called the Hex House, so it's no wonder why it's making the list. News Oklahoma says again, so this is something we feature in our serial killer tour. The new Hex House is inspired by the home that used to belong to Carol Ann Smith. French said the original Hex House, located at 10 East 21st Street, has negative energy attached. I mean, the things that she did with her nephew. 
They were dumping hot water on people that lived in the duplex next to them. There's also that whole history of her keeping those two hostages in the basement and kind of hypnotizing them putting hexes on them. Yes, it's insane, said French. Claims of windshield wipers or stereos going on while the car is off are frequent if parked nearby. French even says they tested the theory during a tour and claimed she never did it again. We turned the bus off, but then it wouldn't start back up. It wasn't until a lady said she called Carol Ann a bad name and then she apologized. As soon as she was done, the bus came immediately back on, French says. The reason this house is on the killer tour list is due to what went down in 1928, guys. John Blymere, after receiving consultation from a woman named Nellie Knoll, thought that he had been cursed by another man named Nelson Raymer. John and some of his friends broke into the home, which is the Hex House, and then brutally killed Nelson. After they did this, they tried to set the house on fire, but it actually didn't burn. Since then, it's been a hotspot for ghosts, specifically that of Nelson Raymer. Number two on this list is the Stone Lion in Bed and Breakfast. This is definitely not the Airbnb you want to be booking for you and your pals for that relaxing weekend getaway you've been picturing. Travel Oklahoma says, stay at the Stone Lion Inn Bed and Breakfast in Guthrie at your own risk as a mischievous ghost child has been seen and felt throughout the home. The spirit, said to be that of 8 year old Irene Hewton, has been known to squeeze the toes of sleeping guests or even crawl into bed with them. The eerie tap 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 of a child's footsteps has also been heard leading from the second floor to the third. According to legend, the 8,000 square foot home was where the child met her fate when a nurse f***ed her with cough syrup containing them. The family later moved on, but little Irene refused to leave. After the Houston family moved out, the home changed into a boarding house and then a funeral home. Paranormal investigative teams have encountered several other ghosts, including a strong male entity who lingers in the basement where the morgue once was. Through the years of people staying here, there have been tons of reports of sightings and interactions with ghostly entities. As mentioned, it's pretty normal to be visited by Irene, the ghost of the young girl who passed here. A bit of a rarer encounter is that of a ghostly music box, though. The owner Becky has come out and said, One of my guests just the other day came out of this room and said, All night long I heard this music box. Now it's unclear whether one of the ghosts was playing this music box or if the box just sort of started on its own, but that would definitely be enough to keep me awake if I was that guest. Pictures, videos, and voice recordings have all been captured here by paranormal investigators many times. It was first investigated by a paranormal specialist 18 years ago, and since then it's been a hotspot for all ghost hunters alike to check out. Unless you're well versed in dealings with spirits, I'd pick a different Airbnb for you and your buddies. And number one on this list is Guthrie's Boys Home. This site started out as an orphanage in 1923 when it was built. Now becoming an orphan would truly be a horrible experience that I can't even begin to understand, but I can guarantee you that it would have been far worse if you got sent to this orphanage. That's because of the horrible atrocities committed here. There is no denying that the maid who worked here back then was sick. Mentally sick, deranged to a point where she felt a desire to these young orphans. It's believed that she would often abuse these innocent children in any number of ways. Now this isn't confirmed, but these are rumors. It's also thought that she even took the life of a few people while she was working here and made it look like an accident. This all culminated one day when she finally took her own life by jumping out of the bell tower and falling to her death. This has obviously led to some spiritual presences staying behind. Lucky for all of us, it's not the spirit of this sick old maid who died. However, as sad as it is, it's the spirits of some of these children here who were wronged. There is apparently one girl who appears to visitors and begs for safety. Crying and screaming children can be heard echoing throughout the building at all hours of the day. The sounds of little feet running up and down the halls are regularly reported as well. Believe it or not, this isn't enough to drive people away though because it's a popular wedding spot. Definitely not the area I would choose to get married if it was up to me though. 
In at number five, we have Batstow Village in New Jersey. Located in New Jersey, Batstow Village is a historic community centered around the Batstow Iron Works. The site was ideal for iron work because there was water for mills, abundant wood for charcoal, and naturally occurring bog iron. The well preserved and lovingly restored village dates back to 1766. As the operation of iron work grew, so did the village. There were mills, cottages, and over three dozen structures and buildings still remain, many from the early 1800s. But by mid 1800s, iron production declined due to the discovery of coal ore. As the need for iron declined, then glass making was pursued by the town, but at that point, the population already started to dwindle. When Joseph Wharton purchased the property, he primarily focused on forestry and agricultural endeavors. After Joseph Wharton passed in 1909, the property was managed by a trust. The state of New Jersey began buying the land in the 1950s. The last resident to leave the town left in 1936, but not before strange disappearances occurred. According to local legend and a bunch of conspiracy theorists, Ong's hat offers a portal to a different dimension. In the 1970s, a few professors from Princeton fled there after being mocked by their quantum physics theories. This is when they claimed to have discovered interdimensional travel. According to other local legends, the devil is the 13th born son of the Leeds, the first inhabitants of New Jersey. Mother Leeds gave birth to a healthy baby, who within minutes transformed into this beast. This old ghost town is said to be a hotspot for the Jersey. Jersey Devil activity, and in the last 50 years there have been numerous reports and encounters with the beast in this area. Some of these encounters include strange tracks along with hearing screams just outside of the village. One sighting of the Jersey Devil comes from a group that saw the creatures crossing the street in front of them. When visiting the village, some say you can feel his presence as if he's walking right behind you. In at number 4 we have Bodie, California. Located up in the Bodie Hills in Mono County, California near Yosemite, in 1859 four miners found a good place to look for gold in the hills near the California-Nevada border. Bodie died in a blizzard not long after, but a small mining town sprung up at their camp. The town was home to 10,000 people. Bodie was a mining camp in 1859 where people had seen gold in its hills. Eventually it turned into a well-populated town. Though like most mining towns, it saw its peaks, its losses, and then its decline. Fast forward to 1962 and the town would be fully abandoned. Although it already showed signs of decline with dwindling numbers at the start of the 20th century, a series of fires forced the last remaining residents to flee the town, leaving it almost exactly as it was in the early 1900s. With the dinner tables still set, shops are still stocked with supplies, and restaurants are still poised to serve long forgotten meals. Today, the 110 silent buildings sit spaced out for traffic and people that aren't there. Buildings such as a barbershop, a church, a mill, a morgue, and a leaning hotel are hulled up by a beam and have been left untouched for 100 years. Though it has been left abandoned for years, some of the buildings are in a crumbling state of decay. K, while others stand strong, full of their original items, but long devoid of their owners. There were also 60 saloons and thus a fair amount of danger. People were robbed and crimes occurred quite often, though the curse of Bodhi has nothing to do with the fires or the shootings. It started because people started taking artifacts from abandoned buildings. They'd take weather-worn shoes or pieces of glass from shattered windows. Somebody once ran off with a piano. Those items may seem like they have no value, but all objects carry equal significance in telling the story of Bodhi. Thus the curse of Bodhi emerged if you take something from Bodhi, bad luck will come around to get you. Because of the rumour spreading of a curse, people who stole items would send them back, often including heartfelt apology letters, explaining that they didn't expect their fish to pass or their romantic life to fail from stealing from Bodhi. In at number 3 we have Tlingua in Texas. The town of Tlingua, Texas was once a bustling mining town full of life, wealth and promise. Today it's a ghost town with abandoned mine shafts, a general store, an old jail, a church, and multiple ghost houses. Tlingua became of interest to local miners in the late 1800s when they discovered cinnabar, a red mercury sulfide. A man by the name of Jack Dawson discovered that mercury could be extracted from the cinnabar and by 1900 there were four mining companies in the area with a population of over 2,000 people. The Chisos Mining Company owned the entire town of Tlingua. At one point they built a general store, a post office, a hotel, a school, a theatre and even a telephone service. Though conditions in the mine were tough with the seven day work week being the standard, working long days in the desert heat led many miners to lose their lives in the mines. To make matters worse, the Chizos Mining Company even paid their workers in coupons, which could only be spent at the company-owned store. The decline 
started once the mines dried up, companies left and the people left with them. One of the scariest parts of the town is the church, which sits on the hill above the ghost town. One quote says, as we approach the church, the door opened all by itself. Inside the church, visitors report an eerie feeling when entering the church. Moreover, several others report experiencing blackouts, blurred vision, and even hallucinations while exploring the abandoned town. Researchers theorize that this is due to low frequency sound waves in the area that are able to alter people's perceptions of the things around them and as well as disorient them. In at number two, we have Ludlow, Colorado. Located about 12 miles north of Trinidad, Ludlow, Colorado is a ghost town known for an infamous event in 1914. A former mining camp, it was the location of the Ludlow Massacre. Beginning in 1910, the resident coal miners grew unhappy over their dangerous working conditions and began to debate a strike. By 1913, a strike had begun, much to the dismay of owner John B. Rockefeller. On April 20th, 1914, there was a massacre in Ludlow, where the Colorado National Guard and Colorado Fuel and Iron Company guards attacked miners, burning their tents to the ground. Known as the Ludlow Massacre, 25 people lost their lives. The massacre was the height of the Colorado Coalfield War, which began a year earlier in 1913. Two coal mining counties, Las Animas and Hurufano, were the centers of the conflict. The United Mine Workers of America led the strike against the Colorado Fuel and Iron, owned by Rockefeller. They were upset over the horrible working conditions. Both parties led attacks back and forth over the years. Today, the old company town of Ludlow still stands as a ghost town, and the site of the tent city is also kept reserved, now under the care of the United Mine Workers of America. A monument to the deceased was also built by the Union at the site. In addition, the cellar where so many innocents perished is still in place. The doorway can still be seen, and the dark depths of the pit can still be viewed. Though this isn't recommended, as many people who visit the abandoned ghost town report a strange feeling when looking through the doorway, and even worse, possible whispers around them with an unexplainable source. And finally, in an form, we have Helltown, Ohio. The abandoned town known as Helltown can be found in the Suyahoga Valley in Ohio. Thus, it's an eerie, deserted town known by locals to be haunted. No people live in the area anymore, though there are still remnants of the lives of former residents left behind. The whole town is surrounded by hazardous roads that seemingly lead to nowhere. Locals believe this was done to confuse any wandering explorers. But the Helltown Church seems to have inspired the town's ominous name. The tiny white church is in the center of Helltown and is central to all local theories. Some say the church was a place of worship for practicing Satanists who still lurk around the closed off roads, hoping to recruit unwelcome visitors. Others believe the town was evacuated after a chemical spill that resulted in bizarre mutations of the residents and animal population. The legend of the Peninsula Python stems from this theory. There even sits an abandoned school bus in the town with legends of its own. The story goes that the bus was carrying a group of high school students who were going to one of the ski resorts near Boston when an elderly woman flagged down the bus. She was in a panic state and explained that there was a young boy in her house who was seriously hurt. The bus driver, in an attempt to help, turned down her driveway and drove into the woods hoping to help the boy. When the bus approached the house, Satan worshippers swarmed it and sacrificed all those on board. The bus sat back there for over 30 years, standing as a warning to all who decide to venture into Helltown. A local paranormal investigator set out to research the abandoned town and to his surprise, what he discovered was truly frightening. He describes Helltown as not just truly abandoned, but is home to many spirits and hauntings. His personal experience with a ghost encounter was returning to his car to find strange people looking into his car windows. Both times the people vanished as soon as they saw him approaching the car before he had a chance to speak to them. Kicking us off at number five, we have the St. Louis Cemetery number one. The first of three Roman Catholic cemeteries in New Orleans, this is a legendary site for ghost spotting. Although you'll need a vetted tour guide to get in. Break this rule and who knows what kind of curse you'll incur. The cemetery is full of above ground tombs, which some refer to as cities of the dead. These vaults are largely from the 18th and 19th centuries, although some of the graves date back to early 1700s. Of course, with all sorts of above ground burials, one would expect to see plenty of ghosts here. Visitors claim to see manifestations of ghosts walking around and an abundance of amateur photographers claim to have captured ghost orbs on film. Digital too. Some ghosts are more famous than others, but at the St. Louis Cemetery number one, none are as well renowned as Mary Laveau. 
The voodoo queen of New Orleans, Laveau made a name for herself through fortune telling, occult studies, and herbal medicines. These days, gawkers claim to see her floating through the cemetery where she's buried, wearing her signature bright colored clothing and white turban. Guests have reported being scratched, pinched, shoved, or even coming down with sudden unexplainable illnesses after seeing her ghost. For many years, followers of the occult would visit her tomb and mark it with three X's, but this led to more severe vandalism and it has been refurbished since. Laveau isn't the only ghost around the graves, but she is definitely the most well known. Just watch your back if you choose to visit and stick with the tour guide. Next up at number 4, The Hanging Jail. The gothic jail of De Ritter was built in 1915. Anything gothic has a higher chance of being haunted, it's just how architecture works. That's why the Notre Dame is so full of ghosts. That and the whole Cloud Frollo situation. Spirit appreciators in the know believe that the jail is haunted by two men hung for the slaying of a taxi driver. Joe Genna and Moulton Brasso hired a taxi driver late one night and told him to drive. For reasons still up in the air, they killed him. Not knowing what to do with the body, the two men dumped it in the old Pickering Mill pond and ran off into the night. Maybe they drove off. I wonder if they took the cab. The body was found and traced back to the two would be on the run murderers, and such they were convicted and then and hung from the third floor gallows. The interesting thing about the gallows though is that a spiral staircase circles around the noose. So there's a vertigo inducing set of stairs surrounding the ominously hanging noose. Definitely a ghost creator if I've ever seen one. In addition to this lovely feature, there's also an underground tunnel connecting the jail to the next door courthouse. That is a tunnel you would not want to find yourself in after hours. Who knows what kind of crooked necked wailing ghosts you find down there. Of course, there are plenty of people who claim to have captured photos of the ill-fated duo along with many other unlucky lawbreakers. Just remember kids, if you want to be a ghost, constantly do things that you'll regret. That way, you'll have all sorts of reasons to stick around for the afterlife. Coming in at number 3, we have the Dauphin Orleans Hotel. What was once a bordello is now a very popular hotel and bar. Jilted lovers, recovering soldiers, mistreated women, they all have a chance to haunt this New Orleans landmark. Of all the stories, there are four that tend to come up no matter who you ask. The first is that of a lost bride, thought to be the spirit of a young woman named Millie. She was working for the bar as a courtesan when she met a dapper young man and they decided to get married. However, on the morning of the wedding, Millie's groom-to-be was shot dead in a gambling dispute. Distraught, Millie waited for days for her fiancé to show up and never took her wedding dress off. For years, she would wear the white dress around the bar, hoping that someday he would show up. Now her ghost wanders the hotel in her dress, waiting for her love. Another classic story is that of the dancing girl. A young teen has been seen dancing around in the ballroom. Many a drunk guest has claimed that a young girl helped them to their room, all the while dancing as if she were floating on air. There's also the tale of the rebel, a ghost dressed in a dark confederate uniform. While no battles took place in New Orleans, plenty of wounded soldiers would end up in the city for rest and recovery, and maybe a little bit of time at the bordello. This ghost has been seen pacing the outer courtyard, earning the nickname the Worried General. And of course, the bar itself, known as May's Place, is full to the brim with ghosts. Employees claim to have seen all sorts of unexplainable stuff, from glasses falling down from high shelves, to locked doors opening up on their own, to brochures swirling around around like fall leaves. If you're looking for a haunted overnight stay, the Dauphine Orleans is probably your best bet. Don't go paying any of the ghosts for services though, you probably won't get what you're expecting. Coming in at number 2, Myrtle's Plantation. Built in the late 1700s, this is considered by some to be one of America's most haunted homes. Made extra legendary by the multiple photographs taken featuring ghosts, you'd be hard pressed to find an ectoplasm enthusiast who hasn't heard of young Chloe. Chloe was a young slave punished for eavesdropping on the family. She took her revenge later on in the form of a poisoned birthday cake. It was served up to the owners of the house and within 3 hours, 3 people were dead. Apparently that wasn't enough revenge for one lifetime though, as Chloe is still said to haunt the plantation. Two different pictures have been taken with apparent ghostly qualities to them. One is a photo of the facade of the house, and if you look carefully in the corner, a ghostly visage can be seen. Another is of two tourists taking a selfie in front of a window, and Chloe can be seen peering out from in front of the curtains. While famous, some folks claim that they could be doctors. 
What do you think? After the Chloe incident, many later owners suffered death and murder tragedies while living at the house. Their ghosts have also been seen roaming the grounds. These days, most of the scary stuff is directly ghost related, so I don't know if it's still dangerous or just a spooky tourist attraction. Maybe the spirits like the attention they're getting from the public and would rather not kill anyone else. And finally at number one, the LaLaurie Lori Mansion. Back in the 1830s, the LaLaurie family was extremely well to do, especially Delphine LaLaurie. She was a well respected member of society and known for throwing lavish parties. All was well and everyone had their fun until disaster struck. A fire swept through the building burning much of it to the ground. Among the rubble, firefighters found the bodies of chained and tortured slaves in a hidden chamber. It appears that Delphine would perform unnecessary surgery on these poor helpless folks too. By the time all this was figured out, the LaLauries had fled the country, never to be seen again. With no way for justice to be served, the souls the people held here remained, looking for revenge. Pretty much all future owners of the property quickly left after moving in. The ghosts haunting the walls are pretty aggressive too, with many people reporting bizarre physical assaults by forces unseen. Today, ghost hunters say that it's the most haunted house in the French Quarter. Historians dispute this, but that's not going to stop the phantom fans from traveling to the haunted mansion. Coming in at 5, West Virginia Penitentiary. Opened all the way back in 1875, the West Virginia Penitentiary in Moundsville is said to be one of the most haunted prisons in the states. The first building constructed on the site was the North Wagon Gate, which was made with hand cut sandstone. The state used prison labor during the process and work continued on this first phase up until 1876. Following completion, the prison consisted of the North Wagon Gate, North and South cell blocks, a kitchen, dining area, hospital, and chapel, as well as four story tower connecting the two administration buildings. The prison also included space for female inmates and personal living quarters for the warden and his family. Once the prison opened, it housed 251 male inmates, including some who helped construct the prison where they were incarcerated. The condition of the prison worsened throughout the years and the facility was eventually ranked as one of the top 10 most violent correctional facilities. On Wednesday, November 7th, 1979, 15 prisoners escaped from the prison, one of them being Ronald Turney Williams, who was serving time for murdering Sergeant David Lilly of the Beckley Police Department. He managed to steal a guard's weapon and reached the streets where he encountered 23 year old off duty state trooper Philip S. Kesner, who was driving past with his wife. Kesner attempted to take action against Williams, but he was shot in the process. The prison was home to riots, fires, and nearly 100 executions during its time in operation. To this day, visitors have reported sightings of phantom inmates and a shadow man wandering the premises premises, as well as unexplained voices and cold spots. You can take tours around this haunted penitentiary and even view the electric chair dubbed Old Sparky. For you brave souls out there, you can also do an overnight session if you dare. Coming in at 4, North Bend Rail Trail Tunnel Number 19. North Bend Rail Trail is located in Ritchie County in West Virginia and is a favorite for hikers, cyclists and horseback riders traversing the 72 mile long trail. However, proceed with caution if you wind up in the area, particularly around Tunnel Number 19, also known as the Silver Run Tunnel. History goes that on one foggy evening in 1910, an engineer spied a young woman in a flowing white dress standing on the tracks. He brought the train to a stop, but when he searched for the woman, she had vanished. He wasn't the only one to spot her either. Many of his predecessors had as well. No one quite knows the origin of the woman in white, although some bones were found under a house near the tunnel. Some people say you can still spot her. Now, those who explore the tunnel are advised to bring a flashlight even during the day, with the tunnel being over 1,376 feet long, which is beyond sunlight's reach. You have been warned. Coming in at 3, Droop Mountain Battlefield. On November 6, 1863, the Battle of Droop Mountain occurred in Pocahontas County, West Virginia during the American Civil War. Confederate forces engaged but failed to prevent Union forces under General W. W. Averill from a rendezvous with other federal troops in a joint raid on Confederate railways. Droop Mountain was one of the largest engagements in West Virginia during the war and essentially resulted in the Confederate collapse. The battlefield site is now preserved and administered by West Virginia as a state park, and the unknown Confederate dead are buried in the Confederate Cemetery at Lewisburg. A wooden observation tower, hiking trails, and picnic tables mark the grounds where the Civil War soldiers fought, died, and some say still remain. Many visitors have reported sounds of galloping horses and sightings of the ghosts of headless. Confederate soldiers, as well as one soldier lying asleep against a tree. Coming in at 2, Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. In the late 
late 1700s, the Clay family moved to West Virginia, which is presently known as Mercer County. The Clay family, comprised of Mitchell and his wife, settled on an 800 acre farm and raised 14 children. However, in 1783, tragedy struck while Mitchell was out hunting. A few members of the Shawnee tribe killed two of the Clay children and burned another at the stake. In retaliation, Mitchell hunted down a handful of Native Americans and killed them. The land in turn became unoccupied for years, up until the early 1900s when Conley T. Snyder purchased the land and built a small amusement park on it. However, the amusement park had just as unfortunate luck as the Clay family. Family. The park featured a ferris wheel and a swing ride and was popular among locals, particularly families of coal miners who resided in the area. In the early 1950s, a young girl on the swing ride was killed when a truck delivering sodas accidentally backed into the ride, striking her. Another child also drowned in the swimming pool, which was subsequently filled in to prevent further accidents. During its operation, at least six people died at the park, which resulted in the park ultimately closing in 1966. In 1985, Gaylord White, a former employee of the park, purchased the land with plans to reopen it. It happened for a brief period, that is, before the park closed again after a 1988 archaeological dig uncovered numerous Native American artifacts, as well as human remains on the property that had been buried prior to the arrival of the Anglo European settlers. In total, 13 skeletons were uncovered, mostly of young children. Perhaps the property is cursed, or perhaps it's just a series of unfortunate events. Who knows? But one thing is for sure, it is one of the most haunted places in the entire world. And finally, coming in at number one, the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. The Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, also known as the Western State Hospital, was a Kirkbride psychiatric hospital that operated from 1864 to 1994 by the government. Originally built by Richard Andrews, it was constructed from 1858 to 1881 and was originally designed to hold 250 people. However, it became overcrowded in the 1950s, with the hospital housing 2,400. 400 patients, resulting in it being forcibly closed in 1994 due to changes in patient treatment. Following its closure, it was then purchased by Joe Jordan in 2007 and is open for tours and other events to raise money for its restorations. During tours of the facility, witnesses have reported door slamming, shadowy figures, and even blood curdling screams from within the building walls. The asylum has garnered such a spooky reputation, it has appeared on shows such as Ghost Stories, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, and Paranormal Lockdown. It was also featured in Bethesda's 2018 video game Fallout 76 under the name Fort Defiance and acted as a base for the Brotherhood of Steel, one of the game's main factions. Number 5 on this list is the Myrtles Plantation. The Myrtles Plantation is located in St. Francisville, Louisiana and is home to a plethora of ghosts. The plantation was established in 1796 and is said to have been built on an ancient burial grounds. These burial grounds have obviously contributed to the deep spiritual presence that it has and the reports that there are 12 different ghosts that currently occupy the space. However, the spirit that is most commonly seen wandering the place wasn't from these burial grounds at all, but an incident that occurred at the plantation many many years ago. Chloe. A slave of the plantation in the early 1800s was eavesdropping one day on a conversation between the family who owned the plantation. The punishment was swift and drastic and they cut off one of Chloe's ears so that she would never do it again. Chloe obviously didn't take too kindly to this and even though she knew it would most likely mean her death, wanted to retaliate. She did so by poisoning a birthday cake which in turn killed two of the owner's daughters. For this, she was put to death and executed. However, it is said that Chloe's spirit still wanders the ground to this day and is the most commonly spotted ghost at this plantation. She will be wearing a turban to cover up her ear that was chopped off when she was alive. If you ever see this ghost, people say that you immediately get filled with a deep and solemn depression that hangs over you for quite some time. People speculate that the deep depression that you feel after encountering her may have been the way that she felt while she was alive. Number 4 on this list is the Whaley House. The Whaley House is located in San Diego, California and is said by some to be the most haunted home in all of the United States. The ghost who haunts the home is not your standard phantom, in fact it is the spirit of a convicted high profile robber from the 1850s. 
Yankee Jim had a good run of thievery, but was inevitably unable to avoid the gallows and was hung off of the back of a wagon in 1852. Thomas Whaley was at that hanging and watched as Yankee Jim died. This did not deter him though from purchasing the very land where it happened. It was at this spot that he proceeded to build what is known today as the Whaley House. It didn't take very long at this home though before the Whaley's quickly realized the errors of their ways. It is said that it took only a few weeks of living there before they started to notice strange ongoings at the home. Doors would slam without anyone around them at all. They may even lock themselves as well with you inside. Footsteps could be heard moving around the home at all hours throughout the day. These footsteps were large. The sound of a big boot attacking the ground. The sound of Yankee Jim. In the entirety of that time the family owned the home, for over 100 years there was never a time that they said they weren't haunted in this house. After the home was donated and turned into a museum, the sightings became more exaggerated. Different phantoms started appearing, screams were heard, items would float from place to place. A parapsychologist even reported seeing a phantom dog run through the home at one point. Frankly, I don't believe all of these secondary claims. It kind of feels like people's imaginations ran with the idea of having a haunting once it turned into a museum. But I do believe the ghost of Yankee Jim to be a very real thing. If you do go to this home, make sure you have no valuables with you, or Yankee Jim may just claim them for himself. Number 3 on this list is Bachelors Grove Cemetery. We just spoke about the most haunted home in America, so it's only fitting that we talk about the most haunted cemetery in America. The Bachelors Grove Cemetery is located in Chicago, Illinois and has potentially the widest array of ghost stories that I've ever heard of. It's not the biggest graveyard in the world, in fact it doesn't even operate as one anymore. It was established in the 1840s and practically abandoned in the mid 1900s. There were rumors that the mafia used to use this place as a spot to dump bodies, as it's reasonably secluded and nobody could see them do it. It's secluded nature, rumors tied to the mafia and the inevitable vandalism that it did receive could all be reasons why it's haunted today. Now I was talking about the mafia and gangsters. Well one of the biggest ghostly sightings at this cemetery is actually a gangster car. The graveyard is right next to a road and people driving down that road have reported seeing the distinct image of a vehicle in the middle of the road resembling a mafia vehicle. People have actually fully swerved off of the road and crashed their own cars and then later realized that nothing was there at all. Others have seen a whole farmhouse appear in the graveyard but when they tried to go to it, it completely disappeared. Cars and farmhouses, these are big apparitions and lead me to believe that the spiritual presence in this cemetery has got to be really strong. In 1991, the Chicago Sun released a very famous picture of the graveyard in which there appears to be the figure of a woman sitting on a gravestone, all in white. The photographer behind this picture claims that there wasn't anybody there when he took the picture and it only came up on the camera. With over 100 ghostly sightings in this cemetery, I do believe that it's claimed to be the most haunted cemetery in America. It's well earned. Number 2 on this list is Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Waverly Hills Sanatorium is located in Louisville, Kentucky and was home to thousands of deaths. At least 8,000 if we're really trying to be exact. The sanatorium was built in 1910 and the main patients that it dealt with were victims of the white plague. Back then there was no known cure and many of the patients died to this disease. That wasn't the only way that they died here though. It is believed that doctors would use these dying patients as guinea pigs for some drugs or treatments that they were developing. However, However, oftentimes this would just result in the patient's death. After the white plague had largely been dealt with, the space was transformed into a geriatric hospital. The liberties that the doctors and the nurses took, they got even worse when this happened. Electroshock therapy was utilized. Major injustices and mistreatments were done on the patients from the nurses. It really all went bad. In the 1980s, this spot was shut down for good, but by that point, the damage had already been done. Now Waverly Hills is one of the most haunted locations in America. People say that there are constant footsteps all over the place even though there's hardly anyone in the building. Doors will slam and lock when no one's even close to them. Phantoms and shadows will stalk people throughout the hallways of the building, seemingly waiting for a moment to strike. Screams and shrieks of former patients can be heard ringing throughout the corridors of the building. Many ghosts haunt the death tunnel which was a place where they used to move the bodies of the dead. In room 502, 
there have been reported attacks on people, where they have felt their bodies seize up and get thrown to the ground. In that room, two nurses committed suicide. Apparently one of them jumped out of the window and the other one hung themselves because they couldn't live with the ongoing death that happened in this place. This building has seen way too many horrible things in its existence to just be a building anymore. Feel free to look it up on the internet if you're interested, but don't go visit this in person. Number one on this list is the Eastern State Penitentiary. This prison is located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and when you hear the types of things that went on at this place. It's no wonder that it's haunted as badly as it is. The facility was built in 1829 and was in service for roughly 150 years. Now if this place had a motto, then it would have to be something about solitude. That was the theme at Eastern State Penitentiary. Being alone. If you were a prisoner there, then you had your very own tiny little cell where you lived alone, ate alone, slept alone, and just existed alone. The thing is, it wasn't just the cell either. If you had to go to the washroom or leave the cell for any reason, then the guards would put a bag over your head and they would walk you to wherever you're going. The only thing that you will ever know if you go to this place is your cell. The mental strain that that amount of solitude would have had on those prisoners, it would have been insane. This wasn't the only form of punishment though. There were reports of chaining your tongue to your wrist and leaving you like that. They would dunk you in water and then they would hang you outside in the winter until your body literally froze. And honestly, there was a lot more horrible things that they did too that I don't even want to get into. Either way, due to all the horrors, due to all the death, due to all the atrocities that went on in these walls, the prison now boasts its fair share of ghosts. It is currently open to the public, however I would not recommend going and checking it out. They have various cell blocks that are all known for different ghostly experiences. One of them has extreme echoing voices of laughter as if somebody was going insane. One of them has what it feels like evil shadowy figures jumping from wall to wall. The bloodthirst that these figures have is reportedly palpable. Another cell block has the visions of the dead faces that appear battered and bloodied right in front of you. Gary Johnson, who works to upkeep the prison, had a harrowing experience here before. He was opening up a cell block to clean it when all of a sudden, his body stopped functioning and he was completely paralyzed but also totally aware. He felt as if spirits were invading his body and hurting his mind as he was frozen. Finally he was released and ran from the scene. This prison is haunted to its core and it must be avoided at all costs. In fifth place we have the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose. Fun fact, California tends to easily be one of the top five most haunted states out of the entire United States. And it was a struggle today not making another list with purely locations from, you know, California. The origins for this crazy tale begin in 1881, when the passing of Sarah Winchester's mother, father-in-law and husband, William Winchester, of the famed Winchester Repeating Arms Company, all happened in under a year, leaving her with a very large inheritance, assumed to be around 20 million, and a 50% stake in the company, making her one of the wealthiest women at the time. If 20 million doesn't sound super rich to y'all, in today's money that would be about 561.6 million. Chump change, right? After living in Connecticut for the majority of her life, an arthritis diagnosis and meeting with a medium convinced Sarah to start a new life in California. She believed her family to be cursed by victims of the Winchester rifle and began construction on what was originally a two-story, eight-room farmhouse, which she purchased in 1886. She and her late husband shared an interest in architecture, and after dismissing all of the architects she originally met with, Sarah decided to do all of the home planning herself. She was known to rebuild and abandon construction if anything didn't meet her expectations, which resulted in a maze-like design. It is believed that said maze-like design was mainly intended to confuse and keep spirits from harming her and what was left of her family. According to paranormal investigators Mary Jo Ignafo and Joe Nickel, the bell tower built on the property was used to summon spirits, and Sarah was known to throw lavish parties for the beings she feared in an attempt to please them. It was reported in the San Jose News in 1897 that a seven-story tower was torn down and rebuilt seven times. Honestly, I respect the attention to perfection, knowing what you want, and you know, having the money to be able to not settle. As a result of her expansions, there are walled-off exterior windows and doors that lead to nowhere, along with staircases that end suddenly, and as the house grew inside, 
size, up to five additional levels were added to the home. When the 1906 San Francisco earthquake hit, the damage to the home was quite extensive, causing the collapse of the seven-story tower and most of the chimneys. An entire wing was destroyed, along with the third and fourth story additions, and pipes began protruding from what were once window boxes. Before the earthquake, the house is believed to have had 500 rooms, and at the time of Sarah's passing in 1922, the house had 160 rooms, 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, 47 stairways, 47 fireplaces, 13 bathrooms, and 6 kitchens. Visitors to the house today have reported multiple instances of experiencing cold spots, footsteps, cooking smells, odd sounds, whispering, doors and windows slamming, and feelings of being watched. Honestly, I still kind of want to visit it. In fourth place, we have Myrtle's Plantation. Located in St. Francisville, Louisiana, and built in 1796 by General David Bradford on top of a formal burial ground, this domicile is believed to play home to at least 12 different ghosts. So brace yourselves for a highlight reel. Our first ghosty story begins with a newly married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff was a cruel and harmful man and owned numerous indentured servants, which was the icky norm at the time, and one in particular that he liked to, um, punish went by the name of Chloe. Now, Chloe tried to protect herself from the wrongful punishments by listening in on the Rudruff's conversations and modifying her behavior, which you know is kind of brilliant. Sadly though, one day after being caught eavesdropping, Clark had one of Chloe's ears cut off. Her mutilation was hidden, at the demand of the Woodruffs, by the use of a green turban. Even though most folks wouldn't see the damage, the painful experience would stay with Chloe and inspire her to make plans for revenge. On the ninth birthday of the Woodruff's daughter, Chloe placed poisonous oleander leaves into the cake, intending to only get them sick so she could nurse them back to health and earn a favor with the family. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Tragically, the dosage was lethal, and it ended up killing the missus and the offspring. After word spread of her actions on the plantation, the other servants were the ones to take revenge. Chloe was hanged by the neck for everyone to witness until the life was drained from her body and then her body was weighed down by rocks and thrown into the Mississippi River. Multiple visitors to the current location have reported seeing the transparent and ghostly apparitions of a young girl wearing a green turban moving throughout the property. In 1992, the owner took a photo that they believe captures Chloe's spirit. This photo was originally intended to be used to secure an insurance policy for the home in case of fire or other natural disasters, not to prove paranormal activity. The the presence of a human figure within the photo was undiscovered until it was developed. Many tests have been done to verify its authenticity, but make sure to let me know in the comments what you folks think after seeing it. Alrighty, what's next? Oh, the next owner of the property, a wealthy family man, and his five wards would pass away from tuberculosis on the property. The home was later passed to one of his surviving daughters and her husband, the Winters. Mr. William Winter was a proud member of his community and taught Sunday school out of the home. So one day, as William was teaching, an unknown man rode up on a horse yelling to see him. And as he came out to address the man, he was shot at point blank range on his front porch. William retreated into the home and staggered partway up the stairs before passing away in his wife's arms on the 17th step of the staircase. The sound of his strong and forceful stomps still linger in the home today, as visitors report hearing heavy footsteps from empty staircases. The overall paranormal activity became more noticeable in the 1970s once it was purchased by the Myers family. Oh, right, remember how I mentioned it was stupidly built over a burial ground? The ghost of a young Native American woman has been repeatedly spotted, fluttering about. During the Civil War, the house was ransacked by Union soldiers, and legend claims that three were killed in the house, leaving a scarlet stain in a doorway, roughly the size of a human body that cannot be removed. In third place, we have the Crescent Hotel. Located in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, it was erected in 1886 and has served several purposes over time, such as a luxury resort, a conservatory for young women, and a junior college. But the strangest mark on its history came in 1937 when it got a new owner, Norman G. Baker. Norman was a millionaire inventor and radio personality who decided to pose as a doctor, despite having no medical training and uh, wanted to turn the hotel into a hospital that uh, could um, cure cancer? He was eventually found out and was run out of town, but his spirit somehow found its way back to the hotel and found some otherworldly company as well. The now operating Crescent Hotel is said to be haunted by at least eight ghosts, ranging from a small girl to a bearded man wearing Victorian clothing. When current owners Marty and Elise bought the hotel in 1997, they hired two certified mediums to do a reading of the building. The mediums found that the hotel showed signs of being a portal to the other side, as in a dimension that holds the spirits of the dead and can be accessed by those on the same frequency as ghosts. That portal is um, located on top of what used to be the morgue. One thing I like to stress, 
especially when dealing with angry ghosties, is to never disturb the graves. And a formal archaeological dig was done on the property in 2019, uncovering Norman Baker's bottle grave, with some of the glass containers clearly showing fleshy remains, while other are believed to have held his assorted curing potions that never cured anyone. If you'd like to see them for yourself, they're on display in the Crescent's morgue. Oh, I uh, totally forgot. The morgue, complete with autopsy table and a walk-in cooler where Baker stored cadavers and body parts, are open for public viewing. The experience comes with seeing the ghosts of younglings huddled under the morgue's autopsy table, pleading for help, the reoccurrence of a Baker patient who also served as a hospital assistant being seen in and around room 419, better known as Theodora's room, the early morning loud squeaking of wheels in the third floor corridor, accompanied by sightings of a nurse pushing a gurney full of corpses down the hallway, you know, only to see it vanish into thin air. In second place, we have Eastern State Penitentiary. Penitentiary in Philadelphia. The castle like penitentiary took solitary confinement to new levels when it was built in 1829. Prisoners lived alone exercised alone, and ate alone. When an inmate left his cell, a guard would cover his head with a hood so he couldn't see or be seen. Now, the prison had to abandon its solitary system due to overcrowding from 1913 until it closed in 1970, although the forms of punishment did not get any less severe. Current reported paranormal happenings have included, you know, disembodied laughter, shadowy figures, and pacing footsteps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elaborating now. Cell Block 12 is known for echoing voices and cackling, while Cell Block 6 is known for shadowy figures darting along the walls, and Cell Block 4 tends to have visions of ghostly faces. Many people have reported seeing a silhouette of a guard in one of the towers. Oh, and that might not sound weird, but um, there's no way to physically get to the top of the tower today, since the brick stairs crumbled away, you know, many, many years ago. One of the more legendary tales comes from Gary Johnson, who helps maintain the crumbling old locks at the prison. In the early 1990s, he had just opened an old lock in cell block 4 when he says a force gripped him so tightly that he was unable to move. He described a negative, horrible energy that exploded out of the cell while tormented faces appeared on the cell walls and that one form in particular beckoned to him. Although executions were not carried out at Eastern State, the prison was home to its fair share of deaths. At least, um, two guards were killed over the years, as were many inmates with their spirits still very much present. In first place, we have the Hotel Monte Vista in Flagstaff, Arizona. So with tourism on the rise in the 1920s, residents of Flagstaff decided that building a hotel was the crucial you know, next step in aiding the city's growth as one of northern Arizona's premier destinations. Fundraising began in early 1926, and by New Year's Day on 1927, the hotel was finally open, offering 73 guest rooms under the name Community Motel, which would later be changed to the Monte Vista, a name chosen by a 12-year-old contest winner. This hotel hosted one of the few hidden speakeasies in Flagstaff during Prohibition, which was, you know, a late-night establishment fed by secret tunnels that were built by railroad workers and ran for miles below the downtown core. Over the years, it has adopted quite a few spirits, and I'd like to elaborate on three of them. Out of the many rooms in this historic hotel where the spirits of the past like to make their presence known, let's start with um, room 220, where an unusual one-time resident, known as the Meat Man, is still causing a stir to this day. This long-term boarder, who spent his days at the Monte Vista back in the early 1980s, had a somewhat unusual habit, hanging raw meat from a chandelier. No one has any clue why he did this, but um, definitely makes him memorable. One day, the poor schmuck was found dead in his room, Nothing suspicious otherwise, and what has happened in that room since that day is um, why he made this list. On one such occasion, not long after the meat man had passed, a maintenance worker for the hotel was up in room 220 making a few repairs. When he left, he turned off the lights and locked the door, but when he returned shortly after, he found that chaos had erupted in his absence. The television was fully on, playing at full volume, and even more distressing, the linens on the bed had been violently removed, ripped up, and scattered across the room as if in a fit of anger. The maintenance worker in question steered clear of room 220 from then on, but even today, guests in the room have reported the television acting on its own accord, though it you know, has long since been replaced, as well as the cold touch of a man's hands. Ooh. Next up, the rocking chair of room 305. So the most common report, which has been well documented, is of an elderly woman in the rocking chair by the window. Guests have long told the tale of the chair moving by itself, knocking against the closet, and some have even seen the old woman herself gazing longingly out the window. While the woman's name is not known, old stories from the hotel tell of a long-term resident who would, yep, sit by the window, day in and day out, looking out into the world, perhaps waiting patiently for someone to return. Finally, I feel like I'd be cursed if I left out the ladies of room 306. In the early 1940s, two women of the night were working their shift, only to be picked up by a man who was staying in, yep, 
room 306 of the Monte Vista Hotel and looking for some company for the night. The two women returned to his room and that night were um, brutally ended and dumped out of the third floor window to the street below. What happened to these women was horrendous and it seems that they agree seeing as their spirits are still haunting this room, lashing out at anyone who dares to stay there. In the decades since, guests have reported the uneasy feeling of being watched, as well as difficulty sleeping. Men in particular tend to be affected, with some claiming that ghostly hands have been placed over their mouths or throats while they sleep. 